Hey guys. Here's the final part of the sealed kunai. It's been a long ride y'all. Anyways, enjoy. Chapter 66, I do I. Naruto's clones were basically him. They knew that they weren't and were mostly subservient to Naruto when it really mattered, like in battle, but they had his mindset, they thought like him, they had his personality. There was a part of Naruto's clone that was vastly angry with what he was seeing as he traveled through the village holding tightly to Hamako. He'd transferred some of his chakra to her to help with her exhaustion, which was the equivalent of squeezing a drop of juice out of a full glass when comparing their chakra sizes. Naruto-sama, Hamako said, still rather weak, but much stronger than she'd been in the house, please take me to Tsunade-sama. There's still a battle left to fight and our secondary defenses still need my guidance to work. She had seen one home of hers utterly decimated before. Had been powerless to do anything other than flee and hide, and even then, when all of the others that remained in Uzushiogakur stood to defend their home to the last she was unable to. That was not the case this time. She loved this village. And even if it was a diversion meant for Toby to get to her, those fires were very real. The dead bodies in the streets were real. The panic was real. Everyone fighting was real, and while she was no shinobi, no combatant, she was someone that could do something to protect her new home. Hamako Kiyomizu had fortunately given herself to a master that understood her fully. Okay, Naruto said, shifting his trajectory for the time being to run along the rooftops en route to the high point of the village buildings where Tsunade would be found in the middle of wartime, you can summon your control board back to you without taking a big chunk of your chakra right? She was still suffering from the superficial side effects of chakra exhaustion. Yes, I can. Don't be worried for me master. I am more worried for you, she said earnestly, grabbing the collar of his root top tightly, that masked man. He was the reason for all of this. Everything that was happening today. And not just today either. Everything that had gone down with the Akatsuki, and so many things before that. He was responsible for the death of Naruto's parents. I know. The yellow-haired Jounin didn't need to be told about any of this. He was already mad enough, but after seeing the village and hearing his concubine's words through his clone, after it dispelled he would probably be angrier. Nothing more needed to be said between them as Hamako basked in the temporary comfort that Naruto could provide until they wound up on the academy rooftop to find Tsunade surrounded by a direct Anbu guard. The Hokage quickly took notice of them and a look of surprise came to her brown eyes, Hamako? Naruto? I thought you were still a full day out? She summoned me back when fake Madara showed up at home, Naruto said, setting Hamako down to stand on her own feet, the real me is fighting him up there right now. Tsunade's face took on a look of shock until a grave seriousness took over and she started cracking her knuckles, Tsunade Baka no. You're giving me an order? Tsunade asked treacherously. Um no? Good answer Naruto, but what about the rest of the village? You're his objective Naruto. If he captures you then he wins. The village comes first. I'm just one ninja, and I can beat him. I'm good enough. Minato was good enough. And look what still happened, Tsunade shouted, getting even her Anbu guard duty to feel a bit of apprehension at the tone of the Hokage, I almost lost you in Amiga Kur, and this is the man that was behind everything instead of Jiraiya's student Nagato? No. I can't let you fight this masked man. Naruto stopped trying to make his points. Tsunade was serious. That was real fear for his well-being. It never ceased to amaze him. With a village full of people that she needed to care for, she still couldn't help but think about him like that. As Hokage that could have been a problem if it hadn't been a situation like this where he was actually a key, but he couldn't help but feel touched. He really did love that old lady-like family. Before Tsunade could keep ranting, she found herself wrapped up in a tight hug by Naruto's clone, faster than her Anbu had been prepared to anticipate. It stopped whatever she was going to say thoroughly in its tracks. Whatever she was going to say died in her throat right then. He'd never hugged her before. At times she'd throw one arm around him fondly, and he'd never stop her. Sometimes he'd even lean into it. He never initiated the contact though. He was the closest thing to blood family that she had left though, but she could never let herself get too attached due to their positions in the ninja system of Konoha. She was his Hokage and he was her Jounin. Here she had miserably failed to keep that wall up any longer, and so had he in return. I'm going to win. Naruto's clone said only to her, unable to see her brown eyes reflecting sheer surprise, let me do this. I'm going to beat that guy, show his face to the world, and end it. Please. You've got to let me handle this. Hamako kept her mouth shut, 
as did the Anbu guards, only doing their due diligence by keeping Tsunade guard and assisting Hamako in setting her control panel for the village defenses under her command. When I was first unsealed that was a hard time to adjust to. And I know I was a handful when you first took over as Hokage, but you put up with me and you believed in me. Naruto clone continued to say, I'm basically grown up now, and you've got to let me take a shot. If you lose, she said, tightening her grip just a bit more in her concern. I won't lose. Before she knew it, Tsunade was holding nothing, as the clone had dispelled itself into smoke that drifted into the air. Damn him. Damn that boy. Her eyes flickered to Naruto's home on the face of the mountain that had a large tree sticking out of it and back down to the village before her that she was meant to protect. If this masked man was the center of this invasion, as Hokage she was meant to be the one facing him, even if she was a medic. She bit her lip almost hard enough to draw blood before striking at the mechanical eight trigrams drum to shift the battlefield of the city streets into the next pattern, Hamako focus your closer attack statues on sector 19. The damned plant men are holding themselves up in west past the waterway and using the bridge as a choke point. Yes Tsunade-sama, Hamako said as she directed the intended Koma Inu statues at the orders of her Hokage. She was going to believe in her master, as it was the only thing she could do for him at that moment, please be careful Naruto-sama. If he lost and was taken away from her, from everyone, she wouldn't know what she would do with herself. Triple X. Miles behind the Hokage monument, with Naruto and Tobi. As the battle had moved off of the roof of Naruto's house and farther back into the woods behind the mountain, the intensity of the fight started picking up, but no matter what Naruto tried to use to sucker Tobi in, he couldn't deliver a debilitating strike with the only thing that he knew for certain would harm him, the Seninki no Ken. This is really getting tiresome dealing with you, Tobi said as he stood on a tree branch, facing Naruto who stood on another, honestly, what do you think you're going to accomplish by fighting against me? You can't touch me. You don't have the talent. Try as you might. For all of your ninjutsu, they're useless. All I have to do is avoid one thing that I can't allow to touch me. Even with your sage mode, what can you do? What can I do? Naruto asked rhetorically, fingers twitching, do you really think I've got nothing? Why do you think I took you away from the mountainside? You thought you were leading me away when you were running? I wanted to get some distance, because I can't do this stuff in the village. Naruto's fingers were almost impossible to see even by Sharingan standards as he blurred through hand seals with a computed practice, few uten, hirogari teihen, wind release, spreading air disaster. In sage mode, everything he did was faster, including his hand seals to the point that for his ninjutsu that required less it looked as if he hadn't even done them, and for those that required longer chains of seals, such as the most recent one, they were a blurry mess. Not only that, but in sage mode, every jutsu was more powerful than without it. What was an awesome windstorm before became a requiem for complete devastation. Naruto's chest expanded and from his mouth he fired Category 3 hurricane force wind directly at Tobi, tearing apart trees at the trunks and rooting them straight out of the ground in other cases. Even if he could make himself intangible, could he stop himself from being blown away by winds that would murder any living being caught within it? His sense of awareness warned him that something had entered his personal zone and Naruto fell down from what he'd been standing on to avoid being stabbed from behind by Tobi's hand, covered in a sharp spiraling blade made of wood, hmm, well at least you're attentive. In his fall from the tree limb, Naruto turned and threw several shuriken at Tobi, shuriken cage bunshine no jutsu, shuriken shadow clone jutsu. Once again though, even when the several shuriken turned into damn near several hundred, Tobi just seemed to ghost through them again as if he were a phantom, fine. Kaminari Shuriken, Lightning Shuriken. Once they were high enough in the air, the Shuriken began to crackle with electricity before shooting down hundreds of bolts of lightning all over the area populated by Tobi. The trees that had been situated behind Naruto and had survived when he cleared the lands of the rest of them with his previous jutsu were struck and their tops were set ablaze as Naruto kept away and kept his distance to try and see Tobi in case he escaped. You just don't get the point do you? Turning around, Naruto's eye caught the vortex of Tobi's space-time teleportation as he came out of it and delivered a punch right in his face, knocking him away with oddly imposing strength. By all means. An amused Tobi said as Naruto regained his footing and faced him down again, keep throwing your best shots at me. I'm enjoying seeing what you've amassed in your little ninja handbook over the years. I mean, admittedly you haven't used anything that I can copy with my Sharingan yet, but keep going. I see I haven't taught you the true meaning of despair yet. It was remarkable, enough for Toby to admit it. Even without actively utilizing the Sharingan except in heated combat, 
Naruto's ninjutsu coffers were vast and dangerous in the versatility that he was allotted with his techniques. Dangerous for others that weren't him of course. I told you I was going to take everything from you, Toby said as a small rippling vortex appeared in front of him and out flew a gigantic shuriken larger than his body, spinning at Naruto speedily like it had been fired out of a gun. Naruto avoided it, and watched it slice through one of the burning trees, felling it before he looked up and saw another rippling vortex prior to large, sharp branches growing out of it to stab down onto him, Makuten, Chika ni no Jutsu, would release, underground roots Jutsu. Upon missing him and stabbing into the ground the branches formed titanic roots that grew out and tried to tangle around him. Nimbly and athletically, Naruto flipped and hand sprung through the roots until they formed a veritable forest, surrounding him and boxing him in. Twisting like stalks, they seemed to enclose around Naruto and savagely crush his body. And then the roots exploded with a collective force of 80 explosive tags. Toby was quite clearly caught off guard by this, leaping away from the pieces of wood hurled away by the brutal blast, now turned into dangerous shrapnel by the force of the explosion, Bunshine Daibakua, clone great explosion. He copied that jutsu from Itachi? But when did he make the clone? Possibly when the roots started concealing him from sight, that could have been when he made the switch. And the clone had been on a dead man's switch instead of a remote hand seal trigger. Once again, sage mode enhanced everything, and that included every bit of the explosion that was created from the jutsu, especially since it had half of Naruto's chakra in it to begin with. But where was the real Naruto? Thinking that he felt a presence behind him, Toby turned and lashed out at seemingly a shadow, no. Quickly shifting around, he tried to quickly warp into his time-space teleport when he heard the subtle sound of metal sliding against something. A sheath. For Toby, teleporting himself took more time than making himself intangible and he could not do both at the same time, but it was the only out he felt he had as he realized what was about to happen. Still though, what happened next, neutralized his attempt to bend time and space to his will. Naruto's sword cut through the vortex that as I was creating for the teleportation and struck Toby's war mask. A gasp came from the man behind the curtain for Akatsuki as he felt the material comprising the mask crack and split diagonally due to the slash. But it did not fall apart. It was a full-headed helmet slash mask, and Naruto only sliced through the front. Oh, I'm disappointed. The blonde Blitzkrieg said, panting slightly at the toll that the steadily escalating battle was starting to take on him, no fake-ass pain scream to make fun of me like the last time? No bullshit taunt? You're not gonna threaten my girlfriend, my bijou, or my village? Come on, give me something here. Go on, laugh. Laugh for me now, he shouted at him, spittle flying through the air with intensity. Behind the veil of the mask, the sword swing drew blood. Thankfully it was unable to be seen, otherwise it would have given Naruto more optimism. Toby intended to stamp out the light of this man's eyes today, all before he ever even drained the QB from his body and ended his life. Is that it? Toby asked, once again at a standoff with Naruto as the forest burned on one side of their battlefield and a desolate land covered the other side, are you done with your little hope spot? Are you finished flailing away at me like a child learning to swim for the first time? No way, you kidding? Naruto said with a big smile despite his situation, I just hit you. I just cut through your portal and hit you. I felt it this time. Now I know I can actually do it. Miracles happen for the fortunate and desperate every once in a while I guess, Toby said, brushing the accomplishment off. Even if the blood was annoying as it dripped down his face behind the mask, it was just a flesh wound, nothing short of divine intervention is going to allow it to happen a second time though. Too bad for you I don't believe in any god. I do believe in blind, dumb luck though. Naruto held up his sword that still had a bit of Toby's blood on the end of the blade, who said anything about miracles or a god. If there is a god I'm pretty sure he or she's got more important things to worry about than some random battle in the woods between some prick in a mask and a jerk Jinchuriki with an eye that isn't his, and even if they didn't. I'd rather save my favor from Kami for a time when I actually need it. The lucky horseshoe is coming out of your ass here and now Uzumaki. There's a thin line between luck and talent. Are you sure it was luck that let me hit you? Instead of answering, Toby created his vortex, and this time without an undodgeable rush from Naruto coming his way before he ever started the jutsu he was able to get into it before Naruto could rightly take another slash at him to stop him. And now it was dangerous again. When Toby was inside of his dimensional rift, Naruto couldn't sense him with sage mode. What happened next could come from anywhere. Focus boy, QB urged Naruto from within, remain calm. Breathe. You are not in over your head, get that thought out of your mind this instant. You're prepared for this. 
You can win against this enemy. We can win. This was a cage level battle, and though it didn't show outwardly, QB could feel the churning dark emotions inside. Naruto didn't believe his track record to be very superb with true conflicts of this magnitude. Against Itachi Uchiha and Sasuke Uchiha it had been a semi-victory as he hadn't finished off Itachi. Against Pain, or Nagato, or whatever his name was, he was destroyed with one hit. Taking his partner's words to heart, Naruto took several deep breaths and pulled out five seals, each with a different element inscribed on it. He paused for a moment but then proceeded to slap the tags on one arm, both legs, and the last right on his chest. He had to time this perfectly or he would blow his shot and be left vulnerable to Toby. Too soon and it would be worthless and do nothing to stop Toby's unreadable surprise attack. Too late and he'd never get the attack off before Toby reappeared and got to him. That was, if the jutsu even worked in the first place. Do it. In sage mode it isn't as blatantly suicidal as it was when you first came up with this jutsu. At least you found a productive way to use those weak seals that you came up with almost a year ago. Making several hand seals, Naruto shut his eyes and prayed that Kyuubi was correct. Otherwise this would be really stupid. With the outbreak of the war after his training for sage mode he didn't have time to experiment with his failed techniques that were too dangerous to use before he learned it. Every clone he'd ever tried it with, even half-assed with just two or three of the elements, before learning sage mode died a horrible, screaming, painful death. It won't kill us. Probably. The second he felt the slightest trace of the familiar malevolent presence of Toby, Naruto did not hesitate and immediately made the last necessary hand seal, Senpu, Gogyo Heshiaru, Sage Art, Five Elements Crash. Powerful chakra surrounded Naruto's body like a flame engulfing his body with a color that shifted faster than the human eye could keep up with between red, yellow, blue, brown, and green, as if he were a walking rainbow. Screaming at the top of his lungs, Naruto threw his arms out away from his body just as Toby appeared to gravely wound him with his gun by. All hell then proceeded to break loose, if this kills me you're coming with me. And then everything went white. Triple X. Meanwhile, miles away, Kanahagakura no Sato. For just a moment, the battle stopped as an awful, ear-splitting pop of a blast hit everyone's senses for a heartbeat. To everyone that felt it, it seemed as if an explosive tag had gone off right by their ears and the sky turned white over the top of the Hokage Monument to the north. It took several beats, but a horrid, hot wind blew down from the top of the mountain that felt like the gates of hell had opened just a crack and carried dust, and all sorts of earthly debris down onto the village. It lasted for several minutes before it quickly died down, and in a matter of seconds it was gone, and the sky went back to the normal dusky color of sunset that it had been before instead of the divine white that it had been. Many of the shinobi that had found a lull in the battle and had been regrouping for their next inevitable engagement of street fighting with the white Zetsu clones could only look around and wonder what the hell that had been. Triple X. Konan swore she'd been killed. That was what she figured when Naruto had set off his jutsu. She'd been observing the battle from far enough away that she felt it had been a safe distance. It had been. She'd been high in the air, a little over a quarter of a mile away watching the Kyuubi Jinchuriki and the former true leader of Akatsuki Tussle. She'd been safe from every massive attack that had been launched by them. Naruto created a damn hurricane from his mouth? He hadn't been aiming in her direction to begin with. She was safe from that powerful force of nature. Toby created a deadly, deadly mini forest? Didn't get close to being high enough to touch her despite the lateral ground it covered. Then Naruto shouted, turned multicolored for a second, and nuked everything. That almost got her. The thing that saved her was the fact that she tried to get more distance the second she saw his body flickering with the telltale colors of the five elements. By the time the white flash of death shot up into the sky she'd been far enough out of range of the horrid blast for only the shockwave to reach her and send her flying. She had to fly herself back to the site of the battle only to look down at what remained of it. Nothing. Nagato, she said to herself as she looked down at the outright devastation before flying off to find some sign of either Naruto or Tobi. She spoke as if the person she was referring to could really hear her at that moment, please hold off on summoning me back. I need to watch the rest of this battle. For you. Triple X. Behind the Hokage Monument, miles away from Konoha. All five elements mixed together at once in the most volatile concoction of elemental chakra at once, combined with Sinjutsu chakra. It was without a doubt the single worst idea for a safe, workable jutsu in the history of ideas for jutsu that were actually workable by human beings. Its use was entirely illogical. Insane even. A jutsu like that was untestable, 
so he had no idea how it would work for himself when he activated it since all it ever did was toast his clones from the inside out presage mode days. All that taught him was that under normal circumstances it would kill him. That wasn't much to go on at the time. From that he knew what the jutsu did with chakra and elements. What he did not know was exactly how overloaded he would feel once all of that went on inside of him at once. There was no comparable feeling to set it against. All he knew was that for once he had way too much chakra inside of his body, and he had to get rid of it all at once or pay the price. And that was what he did. He did it the only way he figured would work in such a dire situation, he just threw it away. He did not know though that the results would be quite so explosive. And so close. He didn't know what he had been expecting, but that wasn't it. Thank the toads for sage mode and the fact that it enhanced everything, his durability, and even the Kyuubi's ability to heal his body without a Jinchuriki cloak. The air was still filled with dust and smoke and it was going to be there for miles around for quite some time. The site where Naruto activated the jutsu was now a grand crater a quarter of the size of Konoha, devoid entirely of life. This was entirely irrelevant, because Naruto was now nowhere near the crater that he had single-handedly created with the craziest jutsu he had ever come up with. The new setting for the young Jounin was a few rocky pillars that looked much like a ritual place at the center of a large lake in a rocky dell. In the recently risen moonlight, Naruto clawed himself out of the lake and onto one of the rocky pillars, clothes utterly ruined by his previous actions. If he had been panting lightly before, he was heaving and puffing heavily as he crawled up onto the little slab of land, that was a bad idea. That was a really bad idea. That was the worst idea I've ever had that actually worked, because he didn't kill me. But man. Are you kidding? That was the greatest thing I've seen a human do in ages. The QB uncharacteristically spouted from safely inside of Naruto's body, if you could have seen that from in here. These pipes were glowing like a laser show. Ha! Huh. And that explosion? Not quite on the level of my Baijudama, but it was a damn nice try. You do realize that you ripped a hole in the sky right? There isn't a single cloud in the air where we were. Why are you so excited about that? Naruto asked in a pained manner as he sat down on the rock monolith, looking over his wounds and tearing away the now useless pieces of his shirt that had been sticking to him. The sheath was still strapped over his shoulder. Damn that thing was tough. I am always excited about destruction on an elevated scale. You know this. With a few coughs, Naruto continued, the only reason. We didn't die in that. Was because it blew us away instead of blowing us up. And we hit the water instead of hitting everything around it. I know. Maybe that masked bastard has something of a point when he says that you're lucky. The QB stopped its sentence mid-taunt when it realized where they were, we were thrown this far away? Hey. Oh irony. What are you talking about? Naruto asked, head lolling to the side as he tried to get himself back together and stand back up. His blood went cold when he felt Toby's chakra resurface as he was still in sage mode and then heard his voice once again. He was still alive. But if he could hear him that meant that at least he couldn't get the drop on Naruto, such a familiar setting. This is the place that first bound all of our destinies together. 17 years ago. Naruto drew his sword and walked around the gigantic rock monolith to catch sight of Toby, hands clasped in his lap, sitting on a rock that seemed like something of an altar in its appearance. He hadn't gotten away from the cataclysmic blast that Naruto had caught him in either. His cloak was ruined straight down to the sash at his waist, with only the right side of it and the sleeve remaining. Half of his mask was gone, revealing the left side of his face and spiky black hair. He was a young man. About late twenties to early thirties if he had to guesstimate. What was strange was his Sharingan. His left eye that Naruto could now clearly see was a regular Sharingan, while the other was a Mangekyu Sharingan but there was something wrong with it. The left was completely dulled and there was no pattern in the eye. How the fuck did you live through that? Naruto asked, pointing the weapon at Toby, I got you. I know I got you. You just stepped out of that portal when I triggered the jutsu and you can't teleport and be intangible at the same time. I know that. You didn't miss. You didn't slip up. Toby admitted with a careless gesture of his hands as if he were conversing with an old acquaintance, I think I can honestly say that your timing was. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Sage mode can be truly terrifying, he said with a slow clap, I honestly did not believe that you had something of that magnitude in you. Not exactly combat friendly, but wow. I underestimated you one time too many, and I got caught. So why aren't you ashes then? Once again, Toby said, pointing to his blank Sharingan eye, you know nothing about the secrets of that eye you hold. The most powerful genjutsu that can be cast upon the user. 
makes illusion reality and reality illusion. In the Izanagi, the boundary between them both is removed. In the face of this dujutsu that can only be utilized by those descended from the Rikidu Senin, even true death is an illusion. And only at the cost of eternal darkness in the eye that was used to cast it. That was enough to take whatever wind was left in Naruto's sails out of them. He did it. He did everything right. He got that masked bastard dead to rights. He blew him away, and there was nothing he could have done about it. Nothing other than warp the general fabric of reality itself to erase his own death. Only the greatest sense of poise in the face of an enemy he still had to do battle with kept him from punching his fist through the rocky ground in fury. Are you despairing yet? Do you see how useless it is? Toby asked, you gave me your best shot, and you almost took me out. Unfortunately for you, when you caught me using the power of my right eye I still had a left one unused and ready to sacrifice just in case. Why the fuck do you have the Mangekyu in only one eye? That doesn't make any sense. Itachi had it in both. From looking at the slab in Naka Shrine he knew that when an Uchiha achieved Mangekyu Sharingan, it wasn't done the same way that an Uchiha developed the Tomoe in their eyes respectively for each one. The same reason you do, more or less. That still doesn't make any sense. You're an Uchiha. Those Sharingan are both yours. One is mine, the other one belonged to another dearly departed Uchiha clan member. Long deceased you understand. He tapped at his defunct left eye socket. It was an implant, I gave the original Sharingan I had in this eye up to a friend as a parting gift before I died. He's used it quite well from what I've seen and heard for all these years, but that's not important here. He didn't understand. Naruto didn't understand any of it. Barely anything seemed to tie together any longer. Genjutsu that literally bent reality to the extent where death could be outright averted, this random Uchiha that seemed to have come this close to bringing the world to ruin. And why? For some plan to enslave the world. For what? It seemed like the callous ambition of a man far older and more jaded than a man that couldn't have been older than 30 should have had any right to be under any circumstances. This place brings back memories, Toby said to try and continue their conversation, the last time I laid eyes on the QB in person it was here. Right after I took it out of your mother Kushina. Naruto's eyes snapped back up to Toby and sharpened on his form, what did you say? I thought you knew. Toby feigned complete innocence, you seem to be so attached to that monster inside of you. I figured it would have told you by now. Your mother was the previous Jinchuriki of the QB, and I am the one that removed it from her. How else do you think it attacked Konoha? You bast. It was because of you, Toby said, I used you as the tool needed to draw the QB out. Female Jinchuriki are exceptionally dangerous to have, because the seal holding the bijou back weakens no matter how strong it is during a pregnant female Jinchuriki's childbirth. You were being used by others to achieve what they couldn't otherwise before you were ever born. I used you to separate your father from your weakened mother, exhausted after giving birth to you. I used that window of opportunity to take the beast from inside of Kushina Uzumaki. I outplayed the great Minato Namikaze, the Yondaime Hokage. So you did kill my parents. Naruto replied, I always knew as much, but I just wanted to hear you say it yourself. Actually I wasn't the one that did the deed. Your father sealed the QB away inside of you, so he did it to himself with the method that he used. But would you like to know how your mother died? I'm quite certain your lifelong partner neglected to mention the fact that removing him from her didn't kill her. The Uzumaki clan is notoriously stubborn for their difficulty to kill. Naruto recoiled slightly but kept his eyes locked firmly on Tobi, QB. What the hell is he talking about? There was noticeable hesitation inside of Naruto's mind in regards to their telepathic link. The QB was either choosing its words wisely, or it was really hesitating to tell him the truth, they were going to reseal me. I had just been released of this man's Sharingan control. I felt I had no other choice than to strike preemptively to try and prevent the ritual. QB, spit it out. Don't start lying to me now. You've been a bastard every now and then but you've never lied to me. I saw you, the ritual location, I knew what they were about to do, and I tried to kill you before I could be sealed within you, QB said choosing not to mince words at this point. If he wanted it, it was time for all of this to come out, your mother used everything she had left to bind me with her special jutsu, and half of my chakra had already been taken from me by the Shiki Fuwen. My last chance was to eliminate you with a loose claw, but they shielded you with their own bodies to protect you. Kushina did not have to die that day, but I am the final reason why she did. Toby could see the expressions change on Naruto's face until he finally found the ones that he had looking for. Shock, sorrow, dejection. There they were, do you see now? 
you never had a chance. He explained, standing up on the smallest center monolith stone before warping to another of the higher ones that encircled it. The boy was stunned. Speechless. No witty remark. No hard-nosed declarations. Nothing. I didn't obtain the QB that night, but the only real threat to my ambitions died the moment that the QB was sealed within you. All it did was delay me for 17 years. All this war is doing is setting me back another few months, Toby continued to say as he almost literally lorded over Naruto from his elevated position, no matter what anyone does, the eye of the moon plan is going to become a reality. You were just a well-placed pawn that my enemies used as an effective buffer against this for all these years. Looking down at the seal that was prominently displayed on his stomach, the one that housed the QB behind it, Naruto placed his hand over it, I can. Forgive the QB, Naruto said, feeling all of the air leave his body as he said it, if it was me in the same situation. Trapped for most of the century inside of humans, and when I finally had a chance to be free I was about to be sealed again. I probably would have done the same thing. You have to be kidding me. It was simply so difficult to imagine for the manipulative masked man. He wouldn't wilt. No matter what crushing revelations he hit him with. No matter how much he declared and showed that his powers outclass Naruto's, he could not break him, the creature that is directly responsible for taking away a mother that would have loved you and raised you with an understanding and support of your position as a Jinchuriki, and you can forgive it? It seemed unthinkable. I can forgive it, because I forgave it a long time ago, for whatever it might have done, Naruto said, forming a fist against his stomach. It wasn't personal that had forced the QB to lash out. It was first outside control, and then it was mere survival that dictated its actions. The second you used the both of us as parts of your plan, even before I was born, you made the very first thing I said to it when I was seven and first learning to work with its chakra truer than ever now. And what would that be? Toby asked with a testy edge to his voice, enlighten me. Neither of us wanted things to be this way. One of Naruto's bar-pupiled eyes gained a feral vertical slit as both his and Kyuubi's voice spoke from his mouth in unison, but we're in this together. The formation of the tiger seal came without warning and fire flew from Toby's mouth, but this was not even close to the height of the danger this jutsu possessed. The space-time distorting effects of Toby's Mengekyu Sharingan created a vortex that instantly spread the fire out over the entire dell, I've had enough of you. Katan, Bakufu Rambu, fire release, blast wave wild blast. The expansion of fire over the entire dell was instant. Even for sage mode's heightened reflexes and provided speed, it was too sudden for Naruto to react to and he was engulfed in the inferno before falling off of his rocky pillar into the water like a flaming projectile. You're in this together? Toby snarled as the rock walls that surrounded the lake caught on fire, surrounding their field of battle in a blaze, how cute. Two tools of war thinking that they have any say whatsoever in the direction of this world. Your only reason for existing, for the both of you, is for someone smarter than you to point you in the direction of a target and send you off to destroy it. It's all either of you are good for. For once in your miserable existences, do something right that will actually bring peace. Naruto pulled himself out of the water, upper body and face covered in burns from Toby's attack, what was that? I didn't hear that with the water in my ears. A belligerent fool to the end. And it was mostly bravado. Naruto was running out of chakra, but chose to attack anyway. Jumping off of the air itself to get up to Toby's position on the rock pillar, he quickly pulled his sword out and engaged in a duel of weaponry against the mysterious Uchiha. Sword against war fan. I need a replacement Sharingan for the one I've lost today from Izanagi, Toby said as he traded strikes of chosen armaments with Naruto, the eye of Shisui Uchiha in your head is the second most valuable thing that you have in your possession right now. I think I'll take it for myself after I'm through with you here today. He taunted as he found himself in a test of strength against Naruto. Gritting his teeth in effort and anger, Naruto took advantage of the close proximity and shot his skull forward for a headbutt, but passed straight through Toby's body, forcing him to stumble out of his balance. I knew I could get you to bite, Toby said as he moved and let Naruto's body pass through him and fall. Before he could scramble back to his feet, Toby kicked him, planting the toe of his footwear into his ribs, well, you made me work for this one. Luckily I stayed in shape. With a breath he let Naruto crawl a bit away before stepping on his heel to stop him. I'm going to take this one out of your ass Naruto. Let's see what you've got left, he said before stomping down on his back hard enough to break away part of the rock pillar. Naruto's grip on the Senenki no Ken weakened, not stopping. Can't quit. Another stomp to the spine destroyed more of the pillar and loosened his grip even more, I'm. I've got two. Another stomp and he let go entirely. There is no such thing as victory in this world, Toby said, 
grinding the sole of his sandal into Naruto's back, your hope is just an illusion. Your symbols of light, meaningless. The people believe in these great men and women known as the Hokage, the Tsuchikage, the Mizukage, the Reikage, the Kazekage. In the end they all die and fade away. It's why Konoha is so insistent that each Hokage get their face inscribed on the monument. Your pathetic, Naruto mumbled face down in the rock, how could I lose? How could let myself lose to someone that doesn't believe in anything? A battle of ninjas was also a battle of ideologies. Two or more warriors putting their beliefs on the line with their lives as the wager at stake. But not tonight. The belief that your parents left in you before their lives ended, that you could do something that they couldn't, that thousands of people before you couldn't. Worthless, Toby said as more fragments of his mask fell from his face, I'm tired of people like you, thinking that all it takes to make the world a better place is a half-assed idea they expect others to follow and the desire to see it through. I'm tired of this world's heroes making pitiful excuses in front of gravestones when they fail. It's better than some coward, too scared to put a name to his own actions. A person willing to watch the world burn, just so he can turn what's left of it into mindless drones. Naruto had to bite his lip to hold back a scream of pain when his shoulder was pierced from behind by a wood skewer from Toby's arm. I'm taking the misery away from this world. You'll live after I take Kyuubi from you, just like your mother would have. And I'll make you watch. I'll make you see the truth. And when you finally do, I'll free your mind from the pain and misery of this rotten world. I want to hear you say it to me, that I was right. And when you do I'll set you free. Free in the dream that is the infinite Tsukiyomi. A dream you call it? Naruto said, trying again to get up only to be squished down harder. His fingertips brushed the handle of his sword but fumbled to get around it tight enough to hold it, how can anyone think that? More of Toby's mask crumbled away to reveal a heavily scarred right side of his face, I can be forgiving too Naruto. After all, you're still just a boy, not quite yet a man. Suffering more than you have to for your ignorance is too cruel a fate for me to force you into. But you will understand. I'll make you. Use your imagination. Think about it. A place where no one you love will ever feel hardship or pain again. My imagination. Naruto thought to himself as his eyes began to flutter open and closed. Well you said the yin-yang release makes the sword change, but what if one variation ain't the range? Kiribai. The words of the Hachibi Jinchuriki came to mind for some reason, from their last conversation back when they were out at sea on the way to Hai no Kuni. Their short talk about his weapon of choice, and its unique yin-yang properties. Yin Yang let the sage make anything real, so why not use it to keep changing your steel? Pick up the pace, don't let that power go to waste. Yin release made dreams themselves take form. Yang release made fantasies real. Using both simultaneously let them come to life, hence the creation of things that were not there before with the Senenki no Ken. It was how the blade transformed. Show me something new. Oh why the fuck not? Naruto thought to himself once more, I'm so tired. I don't even think I'd care how much chakra this thing sucked down at this point. With his spirit tempered once more to go down swinging, no matter the cost, he lifted his head off of the ground and willed the muscles in his impaled arm gripping the sword to tighten around the handle just long enough for him to do what was necessary, holding it up in front of his face, Senen Hake, Aichiji Era Wear, Millennium Release, Primary Materialization. As the sword began to glow, Naruto put his imagination to work as he exerted his will over the blade. What did he need right then? Some clothes would be nice since he was half-naked, soaking wet, bleeding, and burned. Some body support would be nice too since he was quite certain that a few of his vertebrae were heavily damaged at this point. The sword glowed white for a second before it dematerialized and reformed around Naruto's body. The fear of just what this was elicited Toby to jump away from him, breaking off the spike he'd stabbed into Naruto's arm so that it would remain in the wound and debilitate him. What the hell is this? Toby asked from an adjacent rock pillar as Naruto was for lack of a better term re-outfitted, what is this? Grey traditional armor comprised of many metal plates on his body such as over the front and back of his torso, covering his shoulders, stretched down to cover his thighs, and separate pieces of armor covering his forearms down to his hands with sharp nailed gloves, shin guards, and a guard framing his face around his hideate. Right on the front of the armor sat the Uzumaki clan symbol and every few seconds, black seal arrays would randomly flicker in and out of existence somewhere on his body. Naruto's eyes popped wide open and he let out a gasp as if he'd been drowning as he pushed himself up off of the ground. Feeling the tight armor stuck to his body he looked down at his hands and then down at his reflection in the water. He looked so. Old school. But more importantly, he didn't feel a crushing, 
leeching drain on his chakra reserves the way that he had whenever he'd trained with it in the past and the way he had in the middle of battles when he'd used the Millennium Gauntlets. You're welcome. You? Sage mode more specifically, but since I'm the one running it I would say yes, me. How do you feel? Fast. Naruto figured as he couldn't even feel the weight of what looked like really sleek plate and scale armor, lighter than a feather. Ugh. Wait. He cringed before reaching for his left shoulder underneath the plate there and slowly pulling out a bloody wooden spike that he tossed away. Cute, Toby said as he had been watching all of this, wondering just what was going on, this isn't the jutsu you used to beat Kakuzu. Not quite. Something's different about it. I thought that one only covered your shins and forearms. I did what you said. Naruto replied, ignoring the blood dripping freely from his wound underneath the armor, I used my imagination. I laid there and I thought about what you wanted me to. And that kind of future sucks. If everything was always perfect and nothing ever went wrong, how would you ever enjoy anything? So instead of thinking about how stupid your idea is I thought about something more useful, and you're looking at it more or less. Toby rolled his eyes and formed a hand seal, and I'm supposed to be afraid and think you have more of a chance than you did a moment ago just because you got a wardrobe upgrade? Yes. Let it just be known right now that though it has been mentioned before it bears repeating, Sage mode enhances everything. The eye of Toby went to work just as he saw a single muscle of Naruto twitch in his direction, making him intangible to avoid another attack coming his way from the headstrong young ninja in the form of a high-speed body flicker. Only it didn't work this time, and Naruto's fist sank into Toby's right jaw, rattling his skull and sending him rocketing across the surface of the lake water, finally crashing to a rest against the rocky shore where his body left an imprint, he hit me. I hit him. Naruto echoed without hearing Toby say it from where he'd been standing in turn. He had to look down at his own armored fist and flex his fingers to readily accept it, right. I just wouldn't have felt right winning this fight without punching the guy in the face just once. Toby pulled himself up and out, standing back up with a heavily bruised, bleeding cheek and cut under his right eye, that armor. Might as well have been the sword, all over his body. And he wasn't wearing down from simply wearing it, I hate that clan. I really do. He would not get that close again. Fuka Huin, Kai, fire sealing method, release. Naruto's left arm up to the forearm was covered in black flames before he made a tiger seal with his right hand and lashed out with a punch using his left, Senpu, Yami and no Ryu, sage art, dragon of the darkness flame. A mammoth open maw dragon the size of twelve men formed and flew straight across the lake at Tobi, roaring like the general article, or was that the sound of the flames burning together? He uses the Amaterasu he sealed from Itachi in his arm like a pilot light. Brilliant. But it's still too slow, Toby said to himself before opening up a vortex with his right eye, absorbing the black dragon right into it, you're going to like this one though. In the same vein, he turned it right back around and ejected it, sending it flying right back at Naruto with double the speed, and did it get bigger? Naruto didn't stick around to find out, bending his legs and pumping every bit of power he could to them before jumping up, propelling himself higher up into the air with an outburst of wind chakra from the soles of his feet. Down below he watched the flames from the dragon fly toward. Toby? The wily Uchiha teleported to the other side of the lake and waited for the dragon to reach that side just so he could absorb it again into his right eye and fire it back out at an airborne Naruto, once again faster and larger than it had been previously. That was fine though, he had all of the skies to play with in order to evade it. You're not the only one that can create diversions with massive ninjutsu Naruto. Above Naruto's head he looked up only to see Toby looking down on him. He teleported directly above him using the deadly black Amaterasu dragon as something to capture and keep Naruto's attention for long enough to ignore the disappearance of his chakra signature, if only for just a moment. Out of reflex, Naruto shot a fist up to punch him, but Toby stomped down on it to block, anticipating Naruto's physical counter-reaction. You're mine, Toby said as Naruto felt himself getting absorbed into Toby's eye dimension, I'll save you here for later. At least I'll have the QB stored in my pocket where I can save him for last. Naruto quickly created a cage bunshine that shoved him away as hard as it could, taking his place and getting sucked into Toby's eye. Falling down from the sky, Naruto twisted his body only to next have to face his originally created Amaterasu dragon. With a set of hand seals he held out his left arm as the seal spread back over it, Fukahuin, fire sealing method. Like a hyper-powered vacuum, Naruto sucked every speck of the flames back into his arm from whence they came. Continuing onto the water, he flipped through and expelling wind chakra through his feet created a windfall as he neatly landed back on the surface of the lake. Immediately upon landing, 
Naruto created a grossly oversized Rasengan and slammed it down on the surface of the water just as Tobi appeared out of his time-space vortex behind him ready to strike. The unexpected move blew the water sky high. It didn't do much to deter Tobi's attempt to attack, as he still swung his war fan and created enough wind with the attack to blow away the water that Naruto had kicked up to conceal himself. He soon wished that he hadn't as he then found six Naruto's holding larger Rasengan variations, closing in on him from all sides and above, Reoshutsu Odama Rasengan, Zero Illusion Great Ball Rasengan. Forming small flames on each finger of one hand, Tobi slammed it on the surface of the water, creating a cylindrical barrier around his own body, Uchiha Kanjin, Uchiha Flame Battle Encampment. Every Naruto that touched the barrier burst into flames upon contact, destroying all of them except for the original who took a quick dive underwater and resurfaced immediately only to get punched in the face by Tobi's follow-up attack. The hit sent Naruto spinning away on the surface of the water like a top until he stopped and chopped the water, splitting it straight to the bottom of the lake in Tobi's direction. He didn't move an inch and simply made himself intangible to dodge, it's still not going to work like that. It's worthless. Even with that Sharingan, you're still blind. You have no idea how powerful that I is do you? You don't even use Shisui's Mangekyu. This isn't a Mangekyu Sharingan I US. Wasn't it? If it was. How the hell did he even find out or not? Such a fool. Naruto glared at him, but his face suddenly changed as if he realized something. Something incredibly relevant and vital. It was only for a flash though, as he schooled his features thoroughly and Tobi took it as Naruto merely being surprised that he'd forgotten he could phase through basically anything he could throw at him aside from physical contact. The QB was connected to Naruto and knew full well what Naruto had been affected by, do you think it can work? Are you sure what you saw was real? I can see through Genjutsu so it can't be an illusion. I don't know if it'll work or not but I've got to make it count if it will. A quick hand seal formed five clones and three of them went forward at Tobi to engage him in close. They could hit him too, just like their creator, thus Tobi was forced to defend himself. Katan, Hausaka no Jutsu, Fire Release, Phoenix Flower Jutsu. Tobi leapt back and peppered the clones with fireballs concealing Shuriken within them for an added punch that did the trick in dispelling their armored forms, now what? The sound of a clear bell ringing filled the air and his eyes widened at the sight of Naruto and his clones holding up a gigantic Rasengan variation with four wind points enshrouding it, giving it the appearance of a Shuriken. This is it. Naruto and his clones cried as one as the extras dispelled. The original took aim and let it fly like a buzz saw, Fuuten, Rasen Shuriken, Wind Release, Spiraling Shuriken. Fool. Tobi stood in place, forcing his body to become intangible even as the speedy attack landed right at his feet and expanded in a massive, devastating wind sphere. All Naruto did was stand there and watch, a bead of sweat trickling down his face from underneath his face guard as he waited with bated breath for the results to show themselves. The wind sphere died down, though the waters of the lake continued to shake violently. But standing there, still entirely unfazed was Toby. Instead, he just looked disappointed, like a master that caught its trained puppy peeing on the floor indoors, was that really worth the waste? You didn't do anything, even with all of that afo. His lecture fell short when blood spurted out of his mouth like a geyser, what? His internal organs had somehow been turned to slurry and he could no longer stand up. What the hell had happened to him? He'd gone intangible. He avoided the Rasen Shuriken. He knew he had. Let's finish this. Naruto muttered to himself in the QB, Fuka Huin, Kai, fire sealing method, release. His left arm was engulfed in the horrid black flames of Amaterasu one more time, you aren't dodging this no matter what you do. One way or another you're gonna burn. That insolent little. I won't let you, Toby shouted at the top of his lungs, blood pouring from his mouth and nose. Even his right eye was beginning to bleed from whatever Naruto had done, I've lost too much. I've seen how dark this world is. It's not fair. I want a world. I want a world where I have Rin back. Where things can be like they used with to be without any of the war. The fighting. The system of the shinobi is broken. It's a sick joke. In the palm of Naruto's left hand, surrounded by the flames, he held a Rasengan that looked like a dark will-o'-the-wisp. Kuroi Hoshi Rasengan? Black Star Rasengan. You won't touch me with that, Toby insisted, willing himself to stand up one more time. Wanna bet? Naruto asked before dashing forward for the finishing strike. But much like Toby said, he leaned his body far enough out of the way to avoid touching any other part of Naruto's body than the Rasengan and made his torso intangible to make the attack miss. 
I'm finished with you. Toby's right hand turned into a wicked blade as he let Naruto move through and past him. But still inexplicably, one more time he ejected blood through his mouth and found his upper body engulfed in black flames, but it dissipated the moment he became solid again. The pain and the injuries from the Rasengan itself did not, how? It was his complete defeat. But he was not going to die there. No. He had to keep living. He had to keep fighting for the Eye of the Moon plan. His perfect world. Before Naruto could stop his momentum and turn back around to strike at him, Toby had retreated into the vortex that as I could create in an endeavor to teleport away. And there was nothing Naruto could do about it. From there, you're finished. Triple X. Space-time dimension. Toby appeared in a swirling vortex, set in an entirely different plane of existence. An endless void of black, only populated by an infinite number of rectangular prism platforms of different heights and sizes. Upon putting his feet on the surface of one, he fell to his hand and knees, vomiting blood as his body nursed the burns from Naruto's Amaterasu flames. His right side was slowly regenerating the damage wrought upon it, but he was still gravely wounded. How? Did I lose to him? Toby said as he shakily held himself up on all fours, Damn. Damn. Damn IT. His last cry was punctuated by a Rasengan smashing into the back of his neck, pounding him into one of the indestructible prism that made up the ground of the dimension. He did not move again as blood pooled underneath his face. Naruto let the Rasengan dissipate and stood over Toby for a long time before stooping down and feeling for a pulse. He received none. From the corner of Toby's eye, he could swear that he saw the beginnings of a tear forming. You lost because you underestimated me, even after everything that happened, Naruto said, I could never lose to someone whose drive and heart died a long time ago. The victorious blonde just stared down at him before unsealing the Amaterasu flames on his left arm. He touched Toby's body and watched the black flame slowly engulf his body and burn the corpse. He couldn't be too safe, to ensure that the man really did die. The body cooked, and burned to ashes. And the executioner vanished in a puff of smoke with only one thought in mind that he would leave to his original creator to ponder on in his stead. Why didn't he use Izanagi with his last Sharingan to cheat death? Yes, he would have been blind, and the Sharingan powers would have been gone, but he would have survived to possibly fight some way somehow. This really had been a man with no hope left in the world. Toby's last thoughts were never aired or put into words before his lights went out for good. Rin. Kakashi. Triple X. Real world, with Naruto. A coordinated attack from the inside out. That was how the deed was finally done. The clone that Toby earlier absorbed into his dimension didn't dispel to return the unused chakra to Naruto. It remained behind, wondering where it was, trying to find a way out just in case, and trying to pick up all that it could about its settings. When it saw Toby's body randomly appear out of nowhere it figured something was wrong, but saw that it was real enough to touch. Thus the message was sent by a second created clone from the first back to the original, an understanding was reached, and the plan was set. The original would go the original into intangibility, while the one inside would have a devastating attack prepared for the next time an opening presented itself, and the opening presented itself twice. The oversight was all Toby's, thinking that Naruto's clones were so expendable that he could do what he did with no negative repercussions. The backlash from his clone finally dispelling from Toby's dimension hit Naruto's senses and the weight of the world felt like it lifted off of his shoulders. A part of him wanted to laugh. He'd done it. He'd killed the person that had set into motion the plans that had brought the world to total war. The man that had doomed his parents, and cursed him and the QB to be paired with one another for the foreseeable future. He kept thinking that it was all just a trick. That any moment, Toby would pop up out of his pocket dimension and drag his soul to hell or something. But it never came. And it was so hard for it to sink in. There was only one thing that felt right at the moment. Rag. Naruto turned his head to the sky shouted at the top of his lungs, his voice able to be heard for miles around, possibly even back in Konoha. Slowly, his head turned up in the air to stare at a tiny figure that he could see superimposed against the moon. The wings of the angel were a telltale sign of who he was looking at, even if he didn't have the clarity of vision to distinguish who it was. So his blood feud of a conflict had a spectator the entire time? Well there was nothing he could do about it now. Toby had been the priority. If nothing else he hoped she enjoyed the show. But in the meantime he had a message to send. Conan. Naruto howled to the sky, knowing that she could hear him, knowing that she was listening and could damn near see the look in his eyes from even her height, tell pain or Nagato or your god or whatever the hell you want to call him. 
Tell him. Tell him he's next. One moment she was up in the sky looking down at him and narrowing her eyes, probably for blasphemy or something along those lines, and the next moment she had disappeared in a puff of smoke. Good. She'd give him the message while it was still fresh. Perfect. He wanted him to know just what he was going to get, to end all of it once and for all. But for now. Sleep. When Naruto was found the next morning by a search party that could be spared from the ongoing but winding down battle for Konoha, he was floating back first on the water, back in his previous tattered clothes, out of sage mode, clutching the Seninki no Ken in his right hand with an iron grip. And a small smile on his face. Good work twerp. And with that, the QB had to get some rest as well. Using sage mode was a drain even for it after the state of being ended, the things I put myself through. For someone I'm supposed to hate. Chapter 67, Dead Wall Reverie. Such a fool. Hearing the words that he most recently heard a deadly, deadly enemy say to him, Naruto's eyes popped open only to get a hard blast of sunlight straight to the ocular orbs. And he hadn't turned the contact lens back on in his Sharingan eye, so he basically ate a solar flare to the face. Squinting harshly and keeping his right eye shut in the brightness of the room he was in, Naruto realized that he was back in his house. His own bedroom to be exact. Well at least Toby hadn't taken all of his roof off. He left enough for his bedroom to be covered from the elements. Turning to his side with a hand on his head he saw the origin of the fool comment as he saw the uniformed Maki sitting with one leg crossed over the other. Her white porcelain mask sat in her lap and the cloak that she'd worn to better disguise her identity as a root onbu during the battle rested nearby on the floor. Maki-chan. Naruto greeted, keeping his right eye closed while he looked at her, how's the village? It's fine. Maki informed him with a small smile, the battle is winding down but there are still small remnants of the white plant men holding out and hiding in certain areas around Konoha. Don't worry, we'll find them and get rid of the rest. In the meantime the village was still under heavy security, with constant, more vigilant patrols in addition to the active hunting parties, as well as extensive guard placements than normal at high priority places that could have been potential targets to the remaining white zetsus that might have wanted to go down fighting if they were really that obedient to the masked man that had led them into battle. Even if they didn't know they'd just been diversions for him to get to what he really wanted. But he'd failed in both of his endeavors to obtain those things. At least that was what Maki had figured. There was no sign of the masked individual when the search party that brought Naruto back located the site of the battle's conclusion. So now Naruto's battles in Hai no Kuni resulted in two landmark locations. The Forest of Bone, and yet to be named gigantic, barren plain that had been blown into the middle of the forest due to one of the attacks dealt during the last fight. When word about that got around Konoha, everyone was just glad that he'd been willing to take the battle as far away from the village as he did. So, Naruto said with a nervous look, how pissed off is Tsunade Bakken? At you? Very. But I won. But you were stupid and fought the masked man alone. Okay, really? If anyone else had been out there with them they would have gotten blown away at one point or another. Toby hadn't been screwing around and had finally realized that he had to fight to kill even if he just wanted to capture him. The way he conducted himself in the battle with the techniques he used reflected that. Naruto just stared at her with one eye before holding out his hand in her direction as if expecting her to have something for him. Maki just stared at him blankly with the most killer poker face he'd ever seen on a woman before she slowly reached over and dropped something into his hand, his contact lens that he proceeded to stick back into its proper place. Mission etiquette says that you cannot question the confirmed mission plan while the mission is in progress. Maki admitted, moving over to sit down on the side of Naruto's bed, but since your fight wasn't really a mission, and since it most definitely is over now I feel I'm completely in the right on calling you a gigantic jackass. Yeah, I'd tolerate that if you were my wife. Naruto drawled, taking note of the way Maki's cheeks heated up even if her stony expression didn't change, but you're not. You're just my sexy little junior. Winning solved everything. If you went about something the wrong way, as long as you won, what could anyone really say? So what's up? Any news? Maki rolled her grey eyes, but felt the need to touch upon anything Naruto might have missed while taking his last mission to Kumo. Things were definitely afoot around the continent, northern Kaze no Kuni watch teams have reported something that could be either really good or really bad. Iwagakur is mobilizing along its southern border. Naruto's eyes went wide at the possible implications of this fact, you don't think? Never one to be suspenseful, Maki cut him off and nodded there is probably a very good chance that Iwa has finally decided to make a move to try and conquer Suna. At this point they may figure that they can win even if we fight alongside Suna. But. 
But what? They're around the border of lands held by Amiga Corps. Oh, that was a double-edged sword in of itself. If the Tsuchikage was reading the ebb and flow of the war correctly, he would know that the CNF was reeling in on the ropes. The great fence-sitter probably wanted to get while the getting was good and take the constantly disputed lands of the minor villages for himself before the war's end. There was also a chance that he could sweep to Kusagakur and take it over while Konoha was still battling for the great grass village. That would definitely give them a good foothold to launch a quick blitz out to the southwest, and with their earth release users they would have a great chance of negating Gara's nearly automatic army crippling control over sand, enough to use their numbers to bring down the depleted forces. Damn it, why did things have to be so complicated in war? What would he do if he had control of the army? The only thing they could do was quickly finish up with Kusagakur and sit on it. Depending on who Iwa attacked first, the war could begin anew with a new enemy or continue with a third party to join the fighting as an enemy to the other two. What would the Hokage do in a situation like this? The door to the room then flew open and Naruto found himself thinking of something else after he was tackled down onto his bed by a busty silver-haired blur, Master you're alive. You won. She then pulled away enough to give him a curious look, you did win didn't you? They didn't find another body when they found you. Ah uh, yeah. Naruto said, looking over to Maki who was blank facedly buffing her nails idly before he addressed Hamako again, I kind of killed him in a separate dimension so I don't think anybody's ever going to see that body. My hero, Hamako said before leaning forward and giving Naruto a very deep kiss. It lingered on for quite some time until Maki cleared her throat, letting the Uzumaki clan servant know that she was in the room also, oh. Embarrassed at being caught in so brazen an action, Hamako backed away demurely, face glowing red, I am sorry Maki-san. I didn't notice you were there. Did you want to go first? She offered. It took a lot to make someone like Maki lose her composure, but being offered first dibs on the only man she had ever seen in any kind of sexual light was enough to throw her off, w what? We're at a red level threat alert and you're talking about doing something like this with Naruto-senpai now? The seal master didn't answer with words at first, instead choosing to climb onto Naruto's lap while beginning to loosen the obi around her waist that held her kimono blouse shut. Maki held back a very unroot-like squawk and turned around in her chair to avert her eyes. This time, Hamako was much less apologetic about her affectionate actions, my master went off to war without any kind of incentive to return from what is supposed to be his loyal servant. She explained with fond eyes on said master, a motivation like the kind I can give him could be the difference between life and death on the battlefield. And Naruto was all for that. Just not in front of Maki. That was just insensitive. Also it was weird to have sex with someone in front of someone else that you had sex with already. He would have told Hamako to stop, but a massive, dominant chunk of him just didn't want to in the slightest and that was the portion of his mind and control. The side that wanted to stop, or at least postpone her was his logical side and that side had been duct-taped and hogtied in a corner somewhere since back when he decided that it would be a good idea to fight Suigetsu Hozuki in the ocean a few days ago. No one had freed it to resume its responsibilities of moderating his actions yet, hence why he dove headfirst into a geographically warping battle with Toby just one night prior. So the Naruto sitting on that bed beginning to see the pretty porcelain skin of Hamako peek out from beneath her clothes was just A-OK with that, oh, and she never wears chest bindings or a bra. Poof. Before Hamako could open her shirt she was given the sight of Naruto disappearing right before her eyes in a puff of smoke, did I break him? Maki turned back around only to find no sign of Root's true commander, Kiyomizu-san, where did Naruto-senpai go? Triple X. Meanwhile, Mount Myobaku. Poof. Naruto had felt the pull in his mind a split second before his body was hurtled through time and space to be deposited in the dirt on the ground at the place of his most recent intensive training. Usually he wouldn't mind being reverse summoned, but right at this moment he wasn't feeling it in any way, shape, or form. No. 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 Naruto complained as he remained seated on the ground. Reaching a hand out he grabbed Fukusaku who was the closest toad to him at the moment, why? Why now? Couldn't you have waited for like 30 minutes or an hour or something? Getting smacked over the head with an oversized walking stick put an end to that however, right? I'm fine now. From the looks of your pants you don't look fine. Naruto looked down at his growth problem and crossed his legs before realizing just who had brought that point up, Uro Kyofu? You were called here too? Yeah, Jiraiya said with a small smile on his face, how's the homefront kid? Got anything good for me to take back to the troops when we get sent back? I just killed the masked guy that called himself Madara. That's good. Hell, 
That's great. The creator of all of this insanity was finally down and out. And with him clearing out the root of all of the guerrilla attacks going on behind the lines in the northeast front it was only a matter of time until that battlefront was settled. Two of the eight minor villages that had banded together to fight in that part of the elemental nations had already surrendered to Kumo, who were not messing around when it came to cleaning the countryside out. Added on with that, and the fact that Jiraiya couldn't wait to say that he'd killed Kabuto and kept him from reanimating probably the most powerful person that ever lived and taking over his body, yeah things were going great. He attacked Konoha with a bunch of those plant guys we ran into in the northeast, Naruto continued in explaining what was going on recently from home, a whole army of them. That's not so good, Jiraiya said, visibly deflating from his previous emotional high, how many? I don't know. Naruto reported, getting more serious than ever now, I got summoned back by Hamako and jumped straight into the fight with the masked guy. I only got a bit of a look at the village before things really got rolling, but the defenses were working. It wasn't as bad as the Atosuna invasion. I think. Well things could have been worse if nothing else. Jiraiya pulled Naruto up to his feet and pulled him into a one-armed hug, good work brat. Alright, now I'm definitely confident in what I'm about to do. With that he moved aside and showed a toad, black and orange in color with a strange torso that seemed to have metal rings around it, meet Jeratora. Naruto just looked down at the toad and waved, sup. How come I've never met you? Because I didn't want to meet you, Jeratora stated bluntly, I didn't want you to find out what my job was and have you clamoring to hand over my secrets to you. No matter what you think, it ain't yours to dictate what to do with it. In return, Naruto gave him his best route train stare for a full half minute before turning back to Jiraiya, right. Who the hell is this? Why you little? Way to make a first impression both of you. Bravo. Jiraiya thought to himself before launching into his explanation. The best way was to just get everything out into the open, front and center, Jeratora possesses the key to your seal. Say what now? That clearly got Naruto's attention. Good, because Jiraiya did not want to have to repeat himself, you heard me. When Minato created the overall formula for the Haki Fu and on your stomach he left the key to the Jutsu with Jeratora and entrusted me as the only person that could open or see it. Well now it's your turn to have it. Why now? Please. As if I'm more qualified to have it than you are at this point, Jiraiya said with a roll of his eyes, honestly, if she had been a ninja and if it wasn't so unpleasant to get the key I'd have given it to your little servant girly a long time ago. I'm pretty sure if I wasn't able to get Tsunade to sidetrack her with the village defense projects she would have reverse engineered a key of her own before too much longer. Naruto's brain upon hearing that Jeratora was the one that had given Jiraiya the secret to screwing with the seal started backtracking in time, wait, so way back when I was acting all pissy when you took me to Tsuki no Kuni to train and screw around with the seal, this guy was there? I've always been there to an extent. Jeratora grumped out, arms crossed over his chest. When Naruto looked over to Jiraiya for a translation, Jeratora shot out his tongue to slap Naruto to get his attention again, a scroll toad protects the secrets inscribed on them by residing in the belly of whomever they have a contract with. So technically I was there even if I was never outside. Eww. So Jiraiya hung out with a toad in his stomach for years and years. And Jeratora just didn't seem to care too much about that fact. Naruto was completely willing to let the tongue slap and the grouchy attitude slide. If you had a miserable existence like that one you had every right to be grumpy, that's really rough. Hey, what are you gonna do? And he didn't seem to care. Thus another notch could be added to how awesome toads were. Either that or one more thing could be added to how weird they were. So now it's my turn? That's the idea kid. You need it to get full control over the QB. At that thought, Naruto paused. Was that a good thing? Of course it was. But like with all good things, there was probably a price to pay, or something extensively dangerous about the entire concept of getting full control of his bijou's abilities. So he could only imagine just what it would take. What do I have to do? Naruto asked, to get control? I have to beat it in a fight, right? Basically. Jiraiya admitted, it'll be a battle of wills. Win and you get control. Lose and the QB goes free, you die, and too bad for anyone or anything around you when it does. Because it probably isn't going to survive either. A comment hit Naruto in the back of his head at that moment, we don't have to have our final battle now Naruto. You killed the masked man Madara. You've done right by me thus far. Do you really want to risk dying before you've finished your business? What business? Bringing this war of yours to an end. Wait, 
a bijou actually cared about that sort of thing? Naruto figured that the Kyuubi would have been chomping at the bit for him to go ahead and open up the gates so that they could get this whole thing settled up once and for all, the way they always said that they would. Instead of taking the chance at the all-out fight for freedom, the Kyuubi wanted to wait and watch everything be settled, risking the painful death and respawn process that would occur if Naruto died, or worse, being captured if Naruto was defeated and all of his countermeasures to prevent extraction failed. I'm going to defeat you and break free, Kyuubi said confidently. Naruto could just see the toothy grin from the large fox inside of him, but before I do, I'd like to see the end of this ride I've been on with you since day one. I've been waiting most of the century already for my freedom. I can wait a bit longer to devour you and take it. Kyuubi. I. Kurama. What? If I'm going to be fighting you to the finish I at least want you to know the true name of the one that ended your life. My name is Kurama. With that short mental conversation complete, Naruto smiled and looked at Jiraiya and the toads gathered around them. Is there any way we can put that whole thing off until the war is over? Me using the key I mean. Jiraiya just stared at Naruto strangely, why? Because until we finish pain and end this war, I don't want to do something like that, Naruto said, his eyes closing in contemplation, I at least want to tie all of my loose ends up before I let Kurama get a real shot at me once and for all. What's a Kurama? The Kyuubi's real name. Go figure. Ah. Fukusaku, Shima, and Jeratora all looked at Naruto in shock, the first two in quite a bit of concern, Naruto-chan. The last time you fought M, Fukusaku said with a great touch of concern, those six paths is kinda tore you up. And I know you learned sage mode and you took it further than we ever woulda dreamed you would, but. It'll be alright, Jiraiya said, voice full of confidence, you said it yourself. The last time he didn't know sage mode. He was using that full trigger technique of his to force control over the Kyuubi's chakra for a boost. If they were handing out hidden names they were probably on good enough terms, and the workaround for gather the Senjutsu chakra spoke volumes of whether or not they were on the same page, he's stronger in sage mode and he's able to keep his head without destroying his skeletal structure. Jiratora hopped between the two humans and glared between the two of them, Jiraiya, you're saying that the boy is stronger than you? He's stronger than me. The original Toad Sage asserted, and the secret to Nagato's jutsu isn't exactly a secret anymore. Six separate bodies, but the real one isn't amongst them. He controls them from elsewhere somehow. Fei, Jiratora spat, I'll be waiting for him to wisen up then. If Jiraiya couldn't win at his best, I don't see how the child can. He might be young, but he's no child, Jiraiya said, besides, I can't make him take the key, even if it is his. With a grin forming on his face, he rubbed Naruto's head, well that's what this was all about brat. And it's up to you. Naruto didn't need to think twice, save it. I want something to do after the war ends. He felt Kurama smashing his tails against the bars of the cage inside of the seal at the sheer arrogance of the statement. Gah. You suck. I dare you to say that in front of someone that it actually hit you for it because I can't. Jiraiya just stared at Naruto for several seconds, kid. That was the cockiest thing I've ever heard you say out loud, and you've given me some doozies in the past. He ran a hand through his own hair before holding his chin, part of me is proud of you, because that sounds like something I'd say. Another part of me wants to hit you, but the other part doesn't want to start a fight right now while I'm still in command of the Northeastern Front. I've got a war to finish up over there. So I'll see you back home when all of this is over yeah? At some point or another. Don't worry about me. Worry about yourself in the village. With that, the two toad summoners were sent back to their respective places of origin via cancellation of the reverse summoning. Triple X. Kanahagakura no Sato, Naruto's house. In a puff of smoke, Naruto reappeared back on his bed following the informal meeting with Jiraiya and the toads, only now there was no Maki or Hamako in the vicinity. So there would be no chance of continuing where he'd left off back before he'd been summoned. Unfortunately, post-victory sex was not to be in his immediate future. It simply wasn't in the cards on this occasion. Damn it. Triple X. Amiga no Sato, Payne's Tower. Conan walked her way out onto the ledge on the top floor to stand next to the Deva path and overlook the village and the lake that surrounded it. Both of them were silent, as Conan had long since reported to him upon her return that Naruto Uzumaki had killed their benefactor Madara Uchiha. So they were finally free from all tethers to the bastardized vision of Akatsuki that everything became. They were the last members standing. Just the two of them. The way it had always been meant to be. Itachi, Kisame, Sasori, Daidara, 
Hidan, Kakuzu, all dead. Only Zetsu was left aside from the two of them. But that wasn't a problem at the moment. Nor was the fact that Kusagakar was one step short of falling to Konoha's onslaught. With the fall of Kuza, the road would be wide open to Amiga Kur, and the war would touch their lands. But the war had already touched their lands. The damned opportunistic Tsuchikich. He figured he could take Ame while they were fighting their battle to the north with Konoha in the wilds of the Kuza held lands. From the tower, they could see far and wide, and in the distance, on the horizon, they could see the dotted camps of the enemy. They were taunting, threatening, and the village was on lockdown. Nothing was getting across the lake to the village in the middle, no matter the cost. But as far as Nagato was concerned, the enemy wasn't going to get that far. Unless that Tsuchikage himself had come down to fight this battle, there wasn't anything they had that could stop him from enacting the wrath of God upon them. They thought their encampment was a safe distance away from Ame where they could observe the village without risking getting danger close of numerous raids from the enemy before they were ready to make their attack. The Anima path is already en route to the site of the battle, almost in position. The Deva path said to Konan, despite the fact that Nagato himself was right in the next room. She knew why he did it. She loved Yahiko, and he felt that speaking through his body gave her some measure of comfort. Would you like me to accompany your paths and join in the battle? Conan asked diligently. He had no need to comfort her. The only comfort she needed was knowing that Ame was safe and sound. Fighting for it would give her the peace he wanted to have her feel. No. Conan, I can destroy an entire hidden village full of ninja on my own. I can annihilate a camp. I want you to remain here in the village with me. While I use my chakra to fight, inform every citizen to get somewhere they can see the Iwa camp. The Deva Path's eyes didn't leave the direction of the enemy camp, in case anyone has forgotten just how complete my power is, I want them to see it. To restore their faith in God. Any loss of village morale due to the course of the war would need to be restored with a strong showing and minimal loss of life. This was something that he could easily do to make sure his followers did not lose their faith in his ideals. He needed the people behind him to change the world. This would be their time in the sun instead of in the clouds and the rain. Conan nodded and watched the sun peek through the clouds that always seemed to be over Amiga Kor, if only for just a few seconds, before the Deva path vanished in a puff of smoke, the way she'd reappeared in the tower via the Anima path summoning the night before. Even with the numbers against him, if the enemy didn't understand the secret behind the six paths of pain, there was no way any force could defeat Nagato. Triple X. Moments earlier, Iwagakor camp, ten miles outside of Amiga Kor. When the world fell into full-scale war, the Sun Daimate Tsuchika Janaki felt no need to take a side in the upcoming conflict. No matter who won in these little chains of alliances, there would always be at least one loser, even amongst the winners. The most powerful at the end of these wars, no matter what role they took in the overall effort were the real winners. Why wouldn't Iwagakor try to swoop in and pick up the scraps of the effort? Konoha's ninjas fighting the Kusagakur campaign would be exhausted even if they were able to remobilize and reach Sunagakur by the time that Ame was conquered. The way things shook out, Iwa could destroy Ame and Suna in one fell swoop and rewrite the maps for the countries that these villages sat within. This was the moment that Iwa had waged entire wars for in the past, the sort of thing that it had even started the Third Shinobi World War for, and it had fallen into their laps without having to deal with any long, bloody campaigns to put them right at the door of the enemy. This was a minor village, with their best out in the field dying in the killing wilderness of Kuza held territory trying in vain to hold that doomed village. A quick strike force division of 1,000, comparably small to conventional armed forces which would normally be three times as large at least to wage any kind of full-scale attack on a major hidden village. No minor village could hold off any of the big five if one of them were really motivated to take it down at all costs. This was a weakened minor village battered from the war effort that had been infiltrated and partially destroyed almost a year prior by Konoha's Jinchuriki, Jiraiya, and an unknown unit that had somehow gotten to the very limits of the main center portion of the island village. Right now the plan was a rather rudimentary one. It boiled down to basically forming a wide bridge with earth release specialists across the lake, just under the surface of the water to disguise it but allow them to use it to move across the water and use the moved earth to defend and fight back against distance attacks that would come from the center village. It was more complicated than that, but this was what it boiled down to. The land of the camp was easy for them to defend. It was barren and wide open to begin with, capable of allowing people to see far and wide in any direction. Some rudimentary earth jutsu was all it took to make a fortified stronghold. So when the sentries saw a lone figure walking across the grounds, the entire camp was up in arms. 
Sensor ninjas couldn't feel anyone else around. Just one signature. But it was absolutely mammoth, dwarfing the majority of the invading strike force by itself. This is it. One of the red-clad Iwa Shinobi said, waiting for the order to attack, this is the guy isn't it? The one that called himself God? I heard he destroyed Suna with one jutsu to start the war. No way. There had to be a trick to it. Someone that strong. Can't exist. People don't get that strong. Those are just stories. As the figure got closer and became easier to see everyone prepared themselves. An old man with shaggy orange dyed hair and an X scar on his chin, eyes closed, and clad in a black robe with red clouds. Is that Donzo Shimura? It can't be. He disappeared months ago. It was Donzo, or it used to be. Now it was just Nagato's animal path. Through the animal path, Nagato spoke to the amassed enemies, you hidden villages claim that you cherish peace, but every stretch of peace that has ever been brokered in the elemental nations has been nothing more than a mask. A mask for villages like yours to secretly build their strength, come up with new and more dangerous ways to fight, new strategies to use against the other villages or any other enemy you see as your next threat. All in anticipation of the next excuse to start another war. Stepping out at the head of the force, a tall, brawny, bearded Iwa ninja that bore a strong resemblance to the Tsuchikage stood firm with his arms crossed. Mutterings of the man's name, Commander Kyuchi, echoed out through the shinobi and Kunoichi amassed. So you're the leader of Amiga Corps? Kyuchi said, not willing to let his guard down against this man for a second, who do you think you are, thinking you can fight 1,000 shinobi single-handedly? A cage? No. The animal path said, opening its eyes to reveal the Rinnegan, God. Kushios no Jutsu, summoning Jutsu. A large puff of smoke covered everyone's sight before three titanic orange and black centipedes with large piercings in their bodies stampeded out, crawling across the ground at a blinding pace, straight over the earthen ramparts constructed to protect the camp and right into slaughtering every Iwan ninja they rolled over. From the same puff of smoke, a large ugly bird with three legs and a drill-like beak flew up into the air over the camp, holding the animal path on its back to survey everything from above. This is going to be easy. The animal path commented to itself. From the sky it was clear to see the carnage that the centipedes had created had been quick. The losses were piling up already, I won't even need to take the risk of using the large-scale Shinra Tensei to destroy these fools. Iwa had clustered together. They wanted to form up in that manner so that they could defend en masse to whatever Nagato wanted to try at the outset. They hadn't been expecting massive monster summons. He hadn't even used a hand seal, and he'd summoned four creatures at once. Four creatures that they could see anyway. This is not going to be that easy you bastard, Kyuchi shouted angrily, form up your squadrons. The centipedes are too quick to pursue. Wait for the approach encounter. Corral them decently and I can kill them all in one move. With his strongest solo technique. The inspired Iwa troops did their best, trying to hit the centipedes with what they could without trying to let them get close enough to kill them. They had already lost almost 200 in the opening moments of the battle. Projectiles with explosive tags, the ranged ninjutsu they had in their repertoire, anything they had up their sleeves that they thought would make a difference in hurting the monsters, or at least moving them into the appropriate position. They were fast bastards though, moving swiftly through the camp to hide their own movements. But before they could truly start boxing them in for Kyuchi to aim at, dozens were cut down in a matter of seconds, right from the middle of their groupings. The air shimmered and a giant chameleon with Rinnegan eyes and a snake tail appeared suddenly, the perpetrator of the bloody attack. Kill it. Springing to attack, they were caught entirely unaware when the chameleon opened its mouth to reveal within the brawny, mechanized Asura path without its cloak, revealing its six arms. Every hand it had detached from the arms at the wrist, only hanging on by a covered in dozens of spine-like missiles that fired at the enemies that had chosen to attack before discovering the deadly Asura path concealed within the chameleon. Everyone else that was able to react to the attack did so in the most reasonable way that they could, Doden, Doryuaki, Earth Release, Earth-style wall. The slaughter wasn't as horrible as it could have been. But those that survived behind the raised wall still saw, felt, and heard the impact of the explosions. Some of walls weren't created by strong enough ninjas to hold up, collapsing behind the force of missiles that blew up too close. Blood and body parts flew past the eyes of many. And then there were those that saw the horribly smiling face of the emotionless Asura path, more machine than man, before it cut them down with a saw blade protruding from its torso, or crushing their bodies with the raw power of its taijutsu. On the drill-beaked bird in the sky, the animal path had been joined via its summoning jutsu abilities by the Naraka path and the Preta path, 
so that if needed the animal path could summon any other injured paths back to the bird to be healed by the Narika's abilities, and the Preta's abilities could defend this mobile dispatch hub with its own. Kyuchi didn't know what to make of this battle. Almost half of the people that he had brought to attack Amiga Kur had been killed or wounded already. He watched hatefully as two more paths dropped from the sky after being summoned to the battlefield by the animal path, the deva path, and the human path. Despite the height they fell from, their landing was safely cushioned somehow, leaving them entirely unharmed. The deva path looked at Kyuchi's enraged scowl without blinking, you're angry. Someone like you, you've experienced war, that much is clear. As the son of the Tsuchikage it's obvious, you're probably a decorated ninja from the last war. But, also being the Tsuchikage's son, you've probably never felt the true pain that war can bring. You should be thanking me. Thanking you? Kyuchi's voice held a dangerous edge to it, did you just say I should be thanking you? Yes. The long-haired human path replied, after experiencing just a little bit of my pain, you should be able to understand me a bit better. Be grateful. Most regular people like you, never come this close to understanding the will of God. How arrogant could any person ever be? But this was the most dangerous ninja in the entire world and he needed to be killed, at all costs. Kyuchi internally built his chakra and slammed his hands into the ground, causing it to shake as if an earthquake was hitting the area, Doden, Daikadukaku, Earth Release, Great Moving Earth Core. The human and deva paths didn't budge as the immediate area that he and Kyuchi stood on found itself deposited below as if it were a massive elevator platform, sending it 200 feet below the rest of the battlefield's terrain. This wasn't a trap. Kyuchi just wanted to separate the paths from each other. If he could kill two of their attackers himself to help the rest up top, they had a chance to win. But the ensuing battle would only put more at risk if he fought them up top. Just hold on. Kyuchi thought to himself with a grim smile on his face, I'll even up the odds a bit soon enough. Taking Amigakura was the order of the Tsuchikage, and every Iwagakura ninja followed their orders direct from the top to the letter, even if it meant death. Entire clans had been decimated in the past because of this. Just what do you think this is going to accomplish? The Devapath said, it doesn't matter how you try to fight me. The outcome of this battle was decided the moment you stepped onto my lands. From underneath the sleeve of the human path's cloak, a black blade seemed to be produced from underneath the skin of the arm for emphasis, all you can do is die. Well I can always take you with me you sons of bitches. Three hand seals and Kyuchi slammed his palms onto the ground again, Doten, Sando no Jutsu, Earth Release, Mountainous Earth Jutsu. From the bottom of the pit, the ground folded up into two massive quarter-sphere rock formations that made to crush Kyuchi and the two paths with no space to avoid the jutsu. The resigned smile of Kyuchi lasted until just before he would have crushed them, the human and deva paths vanished in puffs of smoke. No. Kyuchi cancelled the sacrificial use of his jutsu by pulling them off of the ground and placing them against the walls before they could slam closed on him, but it still stopped just short, turning his body and pressing him awkwardly, face and back, to the walls, you. Bastard. He grunted to himself, as despite avoiding the crushing he was still stuck there tightly. That was a summoning? Summoning humans? That was unfair. It was impossible. Above he could still hear the sounds of the battle raging on, though the sounds of the fighting grew quieter and quieter. Less and less explosions, less sounds of orders, suggestions, and warnings being yelled. When it stopped altogether from what he could hear, Kyuchi closed his eyes tightly in pain. The silence was haunting. The battle had taken all of 20 minutes at the longest. Kyuchi let out a yell of anguish as he couldn't even move to make hand seals to try and escape. The scope of his jutsu was too large for him to even begin to budge the slightest bit of it with his own strength. When you used your strongest jutsu in a suicide bid to destroy the enemy and failed, you couldn't expect to just be right back into the fight. But he could hardly move a muscle. He heard the echo of the deva path's voice come through to him and went berserk trying to somehow jostle himself free, just to get at him. It would be a shame, to kill you so soon after finally showing you just a bit of my pain. So I'll give you time to contemplate what you've just experienced. Rest assured you're still going to die though. Urami aim, grudge rain. The heavy rain created by the jutsu would gradually fill up the gap that Kyuchi was stuck in. By the time it reached his ankles it would begin draining his chakra, making escape all but impossible as it would continue to rise until he died of chakra exhaustion or drowned. That would give him plenty of time to think about the pain he felt from losing 1,000 souls in a matter of a half hour. Triple X. From Amiga Kur, the entire village turned out onto the rooftops of the skyscrapers to watch the quick obliteration of the enemy at their proverbial gates. 
above them in the sky with an even better view of the fight, Conan didn't turn her eyes away from the base camp for a moment. War coming to Ame hadn't been this real ever since the days the last great war had ended. The civil war, as deadly as it potentially could have been, wouldn't have resulted in Ame's destruction whether Akatsuki won or Hanzo did. This had been the first sign of the sword being set at Ame's throat since the Second Shinobi World War, and even though Nagato had crushed them fairly easily without even having to use his chakra for any dangerous and forbidden jutsu, she had a sense of dread in the pit of her stomach. In Nagato's bid to make the world feel his pain, he was choosing to bite off more than he could chew. Could he do this every single time an attack force came? What kind of war would that be for them? He had lost sight of what the original plan was supposed to be. The original set of goals they were supposed to go after to really make the world understand the futility of fighting. The more he fought and dealt this sort of destruction to the rest of the world though, the more it seemed that Nagato liked inflicting that kind of devastation. It was as if he enjoyed subjecting the denizens of the stronger ninja villages to the complete feeling of helplessness and weakness that they had felt decades prior. The sense of accomplishment he exuded after destroying Sunagakur hadn't been like the one that he had after defeating Jiraiya or killing Hanzo, the view that he had done what he had to do. That no longer seemed to be the case. His way was the right way, and his way was to hurt anyone he saw fit to turn his wrath towards. This god had become one of vengeance. Triple X. Days later, lands of Kusagakur. After the breakout across the Tenchi Bridge that had allowed Kanahagakur forces to collapse the Continental Ninja Federation defenses, Kusagakur and its numerous minor village allies did their best to try and reenact another defensive position to stop them and hold them back. The CNF quickly found that there was no natural position to take that was anywhere near as good as the river at the border that they had initially been able to hold Konoha back at, and found themselves stumbling over their own feet trying to fall back fast enough to take a defensive spot. The following two weeks found Konoha tearing through the wild terrain of the countryside, sending the reeling CNF closer and closer to the crown point of Kusagakur. Brutal constant combat was the name of the game from then on out. Sleep for any longer than two or three hours was rare. The shinobi had to keep moving until it was clear that Konoha's push had stalled, but that never seemed to happen. Some of them were almost wishing that the CNF got their crap back together and managed to defend so that they could take a step back themselves and get a breath they were running out of soldier pills for fuck's sake. One of these moments of downtime for some was a time to be vigilant for the others, to watch over their tired comrades before the positions were switched and they would get their rest before the push continued. The line could never stop moving. The momentum had to be maintained. Fuck, Tuya said, cursing at the nicks she had in her trusty demonic flute after prolonged combat in the jungle, I hate close-range fighting. Can't this be over by now? No one's gotten any leave since Uzumaki took down the fortress behind the bridge. Laying on the ground nearby, using her trench coat as a makeshift pillow, Anko rested her eyes, still trying to stay alert to their surroundings, sure. This can be over. Just teleport us into Kuza so we can sack the place from the inside out and that'll end it. Smartass remark aside, Tuya understood her mentor's point. She still flipped her off though, but Anko couldn't see it so the gesture was lost on her, you know what I mean? but I think the Ame ninjas are the ones that want to keep fighting more than any of the others. You see that too huh? Anko said, cracking a pupil less brown eye to look over at the former auto ninja, yeah, even the ones from Kuza don't seem to want it that bad. They're the ones that are the first to enact a retreat. The battles were almost formulaic at this point. The two sides would come across each other in pockets across the countryside and in the jungles and would do battle until the CNF found themselves overmatched and would flee setting traps and fires to cover their withdrawal. Sitting nearby was the division commander Yamato, who found himself almost spearheading the advance with his Makutan ability. An invaluable ability in the kind of setting that they found themselves fighting in. He could hear the conversation between two of his Tokubutsu Jounin and Anko and Tuya, and decided to chime in between cracking walnuts for him to enjoy in his leisure, remember, Amiga Kur's leader strong-armed the lesser villages around the continent into joining them or meeting the same fate as Sunagakur. These places didn't like the bigger villages that much to begin with either. Give them a few kicks in the teeth and they don't know which fate would be the worse. Anko commented, they just want to go home and protect their own now. I can't say I really blame them. Commander Yamato. Izumo Kamazuki, long-time Chunin from Konoha barreled into the temporary rest position in the jungle that Yamato had been taking with a few other shinobi in his direct squad, sir, there's... I don't. I mean, I've got to tell you. Calm down and spit it out, Yamato said, what's the matter? Nothing. Izumo regained his composure to get his message across, Kusa, 
they accepted the standing terms for surrender. Ame is cutting their losses and heading to the border right now to prepare for the move on their village. That was great news. Even if the other two small villages that had fallen in with Kuza and Ame in the war kept fighting, there wouldn't be that much they could do to hold them off. Hoshigakura wasn't that strong a force, even with their ninjas with odd chakra. Takigakura already surrendered not too long ago, leaving the western front open for the most part. It was almost too good to be true. Maybe now they could move some people off of the line and send them back to Konoha to rest and restore parts of the village that had been destroyed during the attack from the plant man and the masked man posing as Madara Uchiha. This war was almost over. Fuck yeah, Tuya exclaimed, throwing her hands into the air, can I finally go home for a spell? This war shit is for the birds. Not really, Yamato said, standing up from where he was sitting, the most important part is still to come. Now we've got to turn Ame's way and set up for the end of all of this. We've also got to dispatch advance troops up farther northwest to watch Iwa and make sure they don't pull any sweeping moves before the dust clears. At that, Izumo cleared his throat to get attention back, about that. Iwa already tried it, on Ame. They were going to try and take Ame and flow over to take Kuza in one fell swoop before any of us knew what had happened. Apparently that's why Kuza surrendered now, so that if it happened they'd at least have Konoha covering for them somehow. So the war really is over? One of the other nearby shinobi asked. Izumo shook his head, they didn't win. Ame destroyed the division sent their way. Tuya's face fell and she looked at the flute in her hand before muttering, we're still not getting any leave are we? Afraid not, Yamato said, I'm sending word to the Hokage that we're about to leave a detachment around here to work around Kuza's surrender and the rest are heading south. Enjoy a few hours of rest, because then we're going to pick everything up and turn it to Ame. Ah. Oh. Does anyone have a problem with that? Yamato asked, giving the lot of them a ghoulish look that somehow frightened them into line. A man had to rule his division with fear every now and then, good. Triple X. With Naruto, Kanahagakura no Sato, Village Streets. The battle had been over for a few days, but there were still pockets of white Zetsu soldiers that had hidden themselves in the village. Things were still on red alert, with constant patrols from vigilant shinobi. Civilians were kept out of certain areas of the village for safety, with a strict curfew enacted until further notice but things were way better than they should have been. Funerals for the ninjas killed during the battle were to be held off until the alert died down for good. And the village was still being sifted through in areas where there had been heavy fighting, so bodies were still being discovered. Naruto found himself walking through the village day after day looking around. A lot of people had died, but things could have been much worse. Compared to the amount that died during the invasion of Konoha, this hadn't been as deadly a battle. I've seen a lot of people die, Naruto said to himself, hands in his pockets as he strolled through one of the worst areas in Konoha affected from the battle, why am I more pissed this time than I was during Otto and Suna's invasion? Because when that happened, your head was full of scrambled brain hash from the unsealing, Kurama said without even being prompted, you were mentally shot for a while after that. Moody, violent, and you were so out of it all you cared about for half of it was linking back up with Donzo. The only reason you didn't break is because Donzo rooted you when you were a brat so it wasn't the first time you had your head screwed with. Yeah, Kurama kind of helped him keep his shit together back then. Maybe because he knew what it was like himself to be the recipient of a seal. Also, you might be seeing this as your village now. Huh? The last few days when you walked around, what did you notice? It wasn't just the ninjas of this village acknowledging you. Everyone here knows something about the battles you've been fighting since this war started. Your reports that you've sent in since day one aren't sealed records. They're public domain, and they all know you killed the masked man. Probably even further back than that. He hadn't been playing it very low-key since the mission to sack auto bases throughout the lands that had lasted most of a year. And even just from the war, stopping the Kaze Kage from going on a rampage and playing into Nagato's hands, opening up the Western Front by destroying the stronghold holding the enemy back, opening up the sea route so that Kirigakura could finally send their own fresh ninjas to finish up the Eastern Front. And of course there was the battle inside of Konoha that led to Naruto killing the lead perpetrator in battle outside of the village. Fox, are you out of your mind? Naruto said aloud, what does that have to do with anything? I was the only one that could do those things, I kicked ass. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's what all of us are supposed to do. Yes, that's what you're supposed to aspire to do if it's possible as a ninja of Konoha. But who else actually did it? Kurama queried rhetorically, you killed four of the nine most dangerous terrorists in the world and the guy that backed them from the start. 
You've got two landmarks and high no kuni as scars on the earth from battles you've had. If anyone can be marked as the strongest ninja underneath the Hokage, who else would it be? Uro Senen. If you still think he's stronger than you now you're the one that's out of your mind. PSSHT. As he walked, Naruto heard a voice clear off to the side somewhere before hearing Tsunade's voice, if you're going to have a conversation with the QB you should keep it to yourself, she said, sitting on a bench on the side of the street, if there were other people here they'd probably think you were crazy. What are you doing here Tsunade Bakken? Naruto asked, walking over to sit down beside her. She'd been extremely busy since the battle, so it was surprising to even see her at all, let alone see her outside of the office or hospital, this is supposed to be a danger zone. Yes, she knew. She was the one that signed off on the big honking maps of Konoha set up in populated areas around town so that people could know where it was safe to head to, if any of those plant men are really stupid enough to attack me just because I'm alone and think they can win, feel free. I want something to pound a pace to vent some stress anyway. No sake or anything? I told myself I'd never drink during a war. Kami, it sucks, Tsunade said before looking over at Naruto, have I ever told you that Anaki is a senile old opportunistic jackass that doesn't understand the concept of screwing the goddamn pooch? Naruto couldn't help but chuckle to himself at her stewing anger. At least it wasn't aimed at him for fighting the masked man any longer, really? I thought all of the kids were buddies. No. I'm serious. I can see that you'd probably accept anyone attacking Ame at this point, but the man completely misses the bigger picture that goes past Iwagakur and how things affect that village, Tsunade said with no small sense of annoyance, did you know that during the Chunin exam in Suna that you went with me for, he was completely willing to act like he didn't know you were in a fight with two members of Akatsuki. I could handle it. With Gara's help, but that was then and this was now, besides, you sicked me on them. He did that because if you'd gotten caught or killed it would have made us weaker, Tsunade continued, and even with this war trying to staunch out every major hidden village in the war, he was willing to try and pick at the bones when he thought he had an opening. For once I've got to say, what Jiraiya's wayward brat did to them served the bastard right. If only it didn't have to come with him getting so many of his own people killed. Naruto just nodded in understanding and agreement, as much as I hate the guy, I think Nagato did it the right way, fighting them himself instead of having his people fight and draw it out. Of course it also helped that he was more than strong enough to get the job done, especially since no one in Iwa knew how to deal with his technique in the slightest. At the topic of Nagato coming up, the blonde-slash-blonde pair went silent. Every so often they'd see patrolling ninjas hopping rooftops in the distance in the middle of the afternoon, but for the most part they just basked in the silence and tranquility of the day. Tsunade looked over at Naruto and put an arm around him to hug the bastard. He didn't fight it. Why would he have? This was Tsunade, and even if they had a rocky start he loved that old lady. I don't even want to ask you, but I have too. You're going to Ame aren't you? If I don't, what happened to Iwa is going to happen to us when we move on them. Naruto looked over at her with a serious look in his eyes, send me when the time comes. I can send Jiraiya instead. She tried to reason in return, God damn it, Naruto, do you know how close you are to being a shoe in for taking over when I finally drop the hat? I was about to groom you when this was all over. 5 to 10 years from now and that's it. You're the next one. Nobody else is even close right now to taking it. Uro Senen isn't anywhere as strong as he was during the first fight. Even if he knew how Nagato's powers basically work to fool opponents, he didn't have the power to do what was needed to take advantage of it with one arm, you know it's got to be me. I'm the only one that can now. Tsunade still wanted to choke him for running off and fighting the masked man, but the reality of that situation had been that he had been the only person in the village that could have won aside from her. He was the strongest ninja in Konoha with the biggest bag of tricks behind only Kakashi and Jiraiya, and more rabbits in his hat than a career magician. She was needed in Konoha, because if she had gone off to fight, even if she hadn't gotten killed in the fight with the powerful bastard, many more people would have been killed without her there to heal them on the spot with her specialized medical jutsu. So if Naruto was a cage-level ninja, but not the Hokage, it was his place to fight the strongest enemies. And with him spearheading the final push, their forces would be more than willing to fight. Besides, a Hokage in the making needed that one thing to drive the point home to the people that he was the man or was going to be the man, and there wouldn't be anyone else better suited to be the focal point of the battle with the best Ame had left. Get your rest brat. Tsunade told him planning a kiss on his cheek before getting up to go and work out the logistics of the upcoming final campaign. She needed to get Shikaku and his son and see what they could cook up with the land advantage that Konoha would have behind this offensive, if you die after all of this you'll be disappointing more people than you know. 
If I die. I'm taking that bastard with me. Naruto thought an immediate response, I owe him. Chapter 68, The Root of All Pain. When you're raised to do one thing, when your entire childhood development is centered around achieving one significant far-off task decades in the future, the gravity of your situation doesn't set upon you at first. How could it? You can be told that something is all-important, and that you should take it seriously every day, but as a child yet to hit double digits in age how much can it weigh on you? This doesn't really occur until you grow, until you gain a practical understanding of your situation and of just what you are slated to do. As time carries on, things settle into your psyche more and more and the pressure builds. But that's not really strange. That occurs with almost every facet of your life, as you grow older you begin to see just how important even the mundane things in your existence are when you gain the knowledge needed and truly look back on things. No, what really brings about the crushing weight, the pressure of your own situation, is when you know that you're shooting for the absolute top, and that there's no one else in position to take it except for you. When you learn firsthand just how vital your future is to the prosperity and overall wellness of the people around you that you love, and even people you've yet to meet. That sort of realization doesn't easily set onto you over time. It hits you all at once. One day you wake up, you eat breakfast and stare out through your bay window over the village that you call your home, and you think oddly to yourself, someday soon, this entire village is going to be my responsibility to take care of. And then you pause. You freeze everything, because that's a fucking terrifying thought. It was for Naruto. Not because he didn't think he could do it. Too many people believe that he could. Donzo, Tsunade, Jiraiya, Maki, Sai, all of Root, Gara, Yugito, all sorts of people amongst his friends, they all thought he was capable of it. Not because he wasn't prepared, because he knew he wasn't prepared and that wasn't the point. That wasn't the problem. Everything he didn't know yet, Tsunade had already declared she would teach him as she groomed him for a few years to take things over in the aftermath of the war. It was the simple gravity of that idea. The idea that he would be in charge of everything. That he would be responsible for every man, woman, and child within the walls of his hometown. That no matter what, for better or for worse, the buck would stop with him. No matter how important things had been in the past, Naruto had been able to break it down and somehow compartmentalize it. He would tackle things as they came, even if they progressively grew in importance and difficulty. As long as he could keep a straight head outlook of handling things one step at a time as they were in front of him he could take anything. It was why he was able to deal with the progressively more horrifyingly powerful people he'd been taking on since he battled Kimimaro, how he'd kept from feeling in over his head no matter what mission was thrown at him. As things stood, even if he had resigned himself to do battle with Nagato, or Pain, as far as Naruto was concerned it was the logical next step to take. At this point in the war the only thing left to do was take him down and force Amei to surrender. Even with the importance of that battle, Naruto still justified it as being in his wheelhouse because he was a soldier. An extremely important soldier, but still a soldier whose duty it was to battle Konoha's enemies. Then Tsunade dropped the to be Hokage in training news on him and took him from being a wartime commodity to the man who would be king. He wasn't saying that he didn't want it. He definitely wanted it. She just could have been a bit more subtle about it. In that vein they were definitely more than likely related somewhere down the family line, even if it did so happen to be rather distant. Finishing dressing for the day as he looked out onto his village during the sunrise, Naruto finished wrapping his hands and looked back at his bed where Hamako still slept peacefully. She hadn't left his side when he was at home since he had returned from Mount Mayaboku. Such a brave little thing, the poor girl almost lost what had become her home for the second time during the attack of the White Zetsus. Naruto stroked the slumbering seal master's cheek and gave her a lingering kiss of departure on the lips, leaving her smiling as he departed his home for the day, get all the rest you need Hamako-chan. Sleep for the both of us, because I ain't got the time. There wasn't enough in the day. While battle plans were being laid out for the final push on Amiga Kur, Naruto still had some affairs to attend to and some well-earned high-fives to hand out all around to the people that weren't supposed to get them. Triple X. Just outside of Kanahagakur, hidden root base. Hands still stinging from the palm being slapped in an elevated gesture of a job well done, Sai dryly lowered it and stared at it before blankly looking at Naruto who had delivered the high-five, and what was that supposed to represent? It's supposed to represent that you did a kick-ass job Sai, Naruto said, acknowledging the copious healed wounds that were bandaged on Sai's person. He still hadn't fully recovered from the battle, as he had played an important role in the shadows, and you're telling me you got the original? The white and black bipolar one? You're sure you killed him? 
Sai nodded emotionlessly as the director of Root and the to-be Hokage walked through the well-lit hallways of the underground clandestine stronghold, Maki-san was my backup. While you were battling Toby, he followed at a safe distance to observe or interfere if necessary. After the battle was completed he was prepared to attack the retrieval team that recovered your body in the end. And that's where you took him down? That's where I clashed with him. He did nothing to impede the progress of your retrieval team. Sai gave his after-action report by the book, several times he attempted to escape, as he was not very skilled in direct combat for a member of Akatsuki. The black half split from the white half just before I killed him. He would have gotten away had it not been for Maki-san's distance support genjutsu attack. At the time of the battle he requested that she keep it subtle so that Zetsu would believe that Sai was the one casting them instead of someone else. With that formula, the battle went smoothly until the black Zetsu abandoned the white Zetsu, as if it were more important. Maki amended the game plan and ensnared the black Zetsu long enough for Sai to catch up and defeat him as well in a second, slightly more grueling battle. And they burned the abominations to ashes. Any boon that could have been garnered for Root and Konoha in general wasn't worth keeping something so dangerous so close. Sometimes, Pandora's box was best left closed. Eventually reaching what used to be Donzo's office, the two of them entered to see Maki awaiting their arrival, leaning against the desk, Naruto Senpai, Sai Senpai. Good morning. She greeted with a slight smile, so, is there anything in the works yet for the attack on Ame? After Naruto shut the door and shut off the light, Sai flicked on a projector and began showing a series of microfilm slides compounding what they knew of the situation. Here is the situation thus far from what intelligence we've garnered. The first slide was an overall map of the whole continent with updated battle statistics, Kiri is setting themselves up on the mainland, but they'll be concerned with taking Konoha's place on the eastern front. While Konoha was pulling out of the northeast, Kiri would replace them in the occupation and final attacks alongside Kumo so that Konoha could send a good number of ninjas home for a rest and more of them could be committed back west for the end of things. It was obvious. Replace the battle-weary fighters with the fresher ones. And Kumo wouldn't be left holding things up on their end either. The CNF enemies had been whittled away enough in that region that Kiri could handle the lion's share of the remaining combat situations with Kumo assistance. The next slide focused on the west, that leaves the endgame to Konoha pretty much, Naruto said, punching into his palm, Iwa sent 1,000 of their baddest and got smashed, so we're not worried about them doing anything to us. With Suna, we can't ask them to commit too much to this because Iwa could still try to be opportunists and attack them while everything's coming together. Knowing Gara though, he would be more than willing to send enough of his ninjas that were chomping at the bit to take a chunk back out of Amiga Kura's ass after Payne's attack and the subsequent invasion attempt that was rebuked. We have three potential points of reaching Amiga Kura through their country. Three different borders that they have to worry about covering since they don't know how we'll approach. Sai explained, pointing things out on the projected map with his ink creations, four if we choose to snake around the back and go in through the Kaze no Kuni side. North. South. East. West. It didn't matter, because all roads led to Ame. They could hit them from any cardinal direction, or all of them if they so wished. They could try and play things sneaky and attempt a feint on a few sides to divert attention from the true attack. They could simply turn things into a horrid battle of attrition. Naruto didn't like that option however. He knew for sure Tsunade would avoid that option at all costs and he didn't blame her because he'd have avoided it as well, so it was more or less off the table. In the middle of the meeting, Maki raised her hand, actually getting Naruto to chuckle a little at how cute she looked, almost like a grown-up kid in school. He had to actually point at her instead of saying words to grant her permission to speak just to keep from openly snickering. Question. Why are we going through this information and trying to process it ourselves? Maki asked rather astutely, knowing fully what the score was supposed to be for Root when it came to how things were run, Shikaku Nara is the man that is creating the major invasion plans, and Naruto Senpai will be included in them without a doubt, so even if we made a plan here there's no reason to believe we could even use it. Not to be negative about anything, she was just being realistic about it was all, why are we going over this ourselves? Naruto didn't have any problems with that question. It made plenty of sense on the surface, and despite their extremely sensitive and high-ranking positions in a clandestine organization they were still teenagers that would of course not understand everything about their responsibilities. In all honesty and actuality, Maki had a point, because it sort of seemed like they were wasting their time. Nothing they said really mattered in the primary grand scheme of things, because the Jounin commander was the man with the plan and would be the one setting things in stone. That wasn't any of them. That was Shikaku Nara. The three of them were root. 
no one else outside of the organization would know what they came up with, why they were doing it, or that they were even doing anything. They would not be working with conventional forces, and they didn't have enough on their own to stage any functional invasion. Root was the blackest of the black ops, not a main combat force. They took out Takigakura relatively easily in a single night raid due to Taki's lack of knowledge on their existence and their tunnel vision on the battlefield instead of shoring up their own homefront defenses. That shit wouldn't work on Ame. They'd already tried it under different circumstances and failed. So why were they going over all of this? Why did Naruto and Sai even set up this meeting to begin with knowing all of this? There was a good reason for that too. Good by Naruto's reasoning. Not necessarily Maki's once she found out what was up. And not by anyone else's reasoning either if they were a logical being in the slightest. We're going over this ourselves because I think I'm going to be in charge of how I get to handle pain. Naruto told her, being purposely vague as to exactly why they were trying to work through the logistics of approaching Ame when there was someone else smarter and better equipped for the job than they were already performing that task for the regular army. Curious grey eyes blinked on a girl who simply did not get what that had to do with studying the borders of Ame held territory, I'm sorry, but I don't understand why that matters senpai. You still need to be in close proximity to Amiga Corps before you even begin to worry about how you're going to fight that man. It was going to be a battle just to get close enough to worry about how the final approach was going to be made. If anything, she was expecting them to actually start with the area directly around Amiga Corps itself since that was where Naruto would realistically be given reign to take control of his own destiny. Both Naruto and Sai looked at each other, the latter gesturing with his head to tell her what they had worked out as a plan and the former rolling his eyes at having to do it himself. Seriously, Sai was technically the one that was her boss until Naruto became Hokage. He could have opened his mouth at any time to try and help this all go down easier. Why did he want Naruto to explain everything? More than likely, it was because he got a kick out of watching Naruto trying to justify the stupid and or reckless things that he meticulously planned on doing in advance to the woman that was supposed to have been conditioned from childhood to be his spouse. That was definitely why. That bastard was smiling. Sai didn't smile unless he was fucking with somebody. In his endeavor to understand human relationships, Sai seemed to develop something of a perverse joy in picking on his direct second-in-command Maki, and the only effective way he'd ever found to do so was to use Naruto. He was the only subject that could rile her up, thus Naruto was Sai's weapon of choice to use on the poor girl. Which also made it doubly entertaining for him when he could guide Naruto into consciously goosing himself and making Maki break emotional protocols. Okay Maki-chan, er. Have you ever heard of the term Halo Jump? I don't think so. Should I have? Not really, but don't worry, because there's a reason for that. That's because Sai Kouhai and I kind of just invented it a few days ago. There was no humanly way possible to make that introduction sound any more suspicious. That was the sheepish way that Naruto spoke when he knew that whatever he was about say next wasn't going to go over well with his loved ones. Maki didn't even need to hear anything else come out of his mouth before she already knew that this explanation was going to be stupid and or reckless. Please senpai. By all means, go on. Her tone couldn't have been any frostier if it had been Donzo himself speaking. Even her body posture, appearing as if she didn't care about the idiocy she was about to hear, was something that would have come straight from him. Naruto Uzumaki, the man that had killed the puppet master of Akatsuki in perhaps the largest scale battle fought in Hai no Kuni in the last 20 plus years, was about to get shaken down by a 5 foot, 90 pound Rudonbu Kunoichi. And he knew it too. Sai was a psychological terrorist. They hadn't even really started the real purpose of the meeting and he already knew that this was going to be a fun conversation for the childhood partners to have. Yes, it was just a casual explanation from one to another, and he just so happened to be a present bystander with no stake in the proceedings whatsoever. Setting aside the fact that he had just as much responsibility for the overall creation of the Halo Jump concept that Naruto did of course. No one had the right to judge him. That fight with the original Zetsu combined with the amount of time Sai had spent coordinating route to assist the village in battling the white Zetsu army was difficult, and the only thing he got at the end of the battle and a few days of healing afterwards was an explanation of how a lame-ass high-five was supposed to work from Naruto? Fuck him. In return, he could have fun explaining to his hand-picked political wife the science of why what he just brought up was a tactically effective method of achieving their objective, and more than just an extravagant form of suicide. Watching that mismatch was his reward for a job well done. Triple X. Amiga Kurno Sato, Payne's Tower. The entire village was set on fortifying itself in preparation for what was certain to be the coming invasion of the enemy. 
one had already tried and their God had rebuked the fools before they even came within pointing and shouting distance of Ame. It wasn't that difficult a task to do, mostly just a matter of ensuring that emergency escape procedures were set, and that the outer banks of the village were ready to turn back an enemy. Due to being surrounded by the large lake around their village, and long plains around that, it was a place where they would be able to see an approach coming from anywhere, even if the attack could come from anywhere. There were plenty of nasty places on the way to the village that could bog down and deter an assault force altogether. It wasn't just luck that kept Amigacor from being conquered despite the number of wars that had been fought between the other greater nations that had ravaged their lands. Don't worry about anything, Nagato said to Conan, able to see her staring out over the village from his mechanical command chair, I won't let anyone get close to our home, and with your jutsu as a last resort, no one will destroy this place. You have a plan? I do. Conan's heart swelled in the hopes that Nagato had retained the leadership traits that one would expect from someone that all of their faith had been placed in, we will destroy them, break the back of their attack. Nothing in the plan has changed. And her heart sank. With everything that had happened since Yahiko's death, the whirlwind of events and the rise of Akatsuki, and the last two years of their plans coming to fruition, she had missed a point that was extremely notable now that everything was on display on a larger scale. Nagato didn't have the true qualities of leadership that one needed in a ruler meant to lead a hidden village. It was as simple as that. Toby, Madara, whatever you wanted to call him, he really had been the one in charge. All of the plans for Akatsuki that had been more intricate that splitting up the members into groups and selecting which bijou to send them after, all of the plans that had truly been laying out to get their power and shake up the landscape to set the foundation for them had been facilitated by their masked benefactor. The upheaval in Kiri that led to them getting not only setting up a situation where they could later get to the Sanbi without taking on a hidden village, as well as resulting in their obtaining the services of Kisame Hoshigaki, Tobi. The failed attempt at obtaining the Kyubi which resulted in perhaps the finest Hokage in generations dying, a superpower in the ninja world losing significant power in one night, and what eventually set the stage for the extermination of the Uchiha clan, further weakening Konoha, and the inclusion of Itachi Uchiha in their ranks, Tobi. There were other incidents over the better part of the last 17 or so years that would also make great examples of this. Nagato had been an executive that had power over the rest of Akatsuki, and the simple concept of the task of capturing the bijou, despite its importance and danger, was an operation that any of the members of Akatsuki could have had overall control of. Other than telling who to go where and when, being the leader of Akatsuki didn't mean anything. They had all been bodies, tasked with collecting the bijou in Toby's stead. Nagato was the figurehead leader directing the remainder of them with the illusion of possessing real power in Akatsuki, as Toby had never once tried to control how he did things. All paths led to him collecting the bijou. How he got there never mattered because he knew Nagato would do it regardless. When the scope of their operation expanded past just 9 or 10 people that had been somehow coerced or cowed into joining the organization, after Nagato had achieved one of his dreams in killing Hanzo and taking over Ame, it became slowly, Shockingly apparent that Nagato was not adept in being responsible for that many people. The immediate aftermath after he'd taken over had masked this as far as Conan's eyes had been able to see, with the incident involving Jiraiya and Naruto and the eventual declaration of war around two months later. But in that entire span of time, the quality of life in Ame had declined steeply. The setbacks after the initial victories in the war had illuminated it, but ever dutiful to the cause of supporting her childhood friend she ignored them. After the war everything would get better, that was what she told herself. War brought hardship in heaps, and after they won and achieved it all the sky would be the limit. These were the thoughts that she used to cloud the logical perspective that she should have had regarding her home situation. Nagato simply did not have the ability to see what was in front of him that was necessary to run the day-to-day -day of a village. Akatsuki had no hierarchy, it was Nagato telling the others what to do, and it worked because their task was simple and there were just ten of them at their height of manpower. He tried to run Ame similarly. He'd give blanket orders, issue general commands to the entire population. After taking over he'd killed everyone attached with Hanzo's rule, basically stripping the entire governing hierarchy and had never been replaced, so there was no quality control, no micromanagement. A hidden village ran like a machine, with integral parts all over that were needed to ensure that the main part was able to do what it needed to. It had to work like that in order to thrive, but that didn't exist here. There was no system of command how he could believe that everything would still work the way they had originally designed it to. After everything that had happened, after it had all come down to the two of them and the village that surrounded them incurring the wrath of all five major hidden villages, four of whom were aligned together. It reeked of lunacy. This wouldn't drag the entire village down with them would it? It couldn't. 
Even as he was, Nagato wouldn't let something horrible happen to Ame, would he? Above everything else, this was the place that they swore first and foremost, above everything else, to protect from the injustices of the bigger villages. Or had he forgotten that? Triple X. Kanahaga Kurano Sato, Academy Roof. With the closing of the Eastern Front for Konoha, many ninjas came home in time for the funerals from the defense of the village, even returning with bodies from their theater of the war to bury and pay their respects to as well. It was a moment of closure for those that had been fighting so hard out on the battlefield, and the village shut down for a few hours for the duration of the service. But it could only last for so long. Like the machine that it was, there was still work to be done, and those within the walls of the village remained strong. Tomorrow was the day that those meant to head out to join up with the division on the western front were to be dispatched. It was all coming to a head. Most of the ninjas that knew they were going walked around the village with a nervous swagger. These people would be shoulder to shoulder with their trusted comrades and they were still nervous. There was one man that had decided that it was up to him to take his own approach to keep more lives from being lost. If this worked, not only would less GSA ninjas die, less ninjas from Ame would die as well. Only one hurdle left, and Naruto's generation would have survived their first major war. Hopefully they never got any bigger than this. So the only other person I've told my plan to assassinate Pain to is still pissed off at me, which is great. Naruto finished sarcastically to Jiraiya as the two of them sat on the top of the academy looking out at the town. From how you reacted just now, I'm probably not gonna tell anyone else about it until after I do it. He thought it was a great idea. First of all Brad, Jiraiya said with a dry look on his face, I don't trust plans that come with their own acronyms, especially when the one that made the plan made the acronym to go with it. Second of all, say that your little plan doesn't make you crap out your spine or you don't get stopped after you get in, how the fuck do you plan on getting out after you finish the job, in a box? No. I've got a plan, just trust me. Can you trust me? This is what I was made for. I used to do S rank infiltration all the time until you and me screwed up the last one in Ame. Then Tsunade Bakken retired me from it. Every fiber of my being is screaming at me to tell Tsunade Haim what you're going to do, but hell, I'm zero for two when it comes to anything having to do with Amiga Core, so what do I know? Good. You're not going to tell anyone what you're going to do are you? Nope. Jiraiya sent his last student a glare of warning, kid. Doing something as idiotic as what Naruto was planning on attempting was one thing. Doing it all alone was another. Doing something that idiotic all alone without informing a soul what you were going to do, even when you were going to be the focal point of a major military action was just too much. Uro Kyofu, if I tell Shikaku what I want to do and if he agrees to it he's going to alter the whole plan of the army's approach, because he's going to do whatever he can to make sure I don't go in without some kind of out. Naruto reasoned with his godfather, that's not gonna work. The more people involved in this the less chance it has of going off without a hitch. It sounded dumb, but the fact of the matter was that there was some credence to it. One thousand damn good ninjas didn't even get within sight of Amiga Core. Hundreds of Rude Anbu only got into Ame after Naruto and Jiraiya made the biggest distraction in history in fighting all six of Nagato's paths, Konan, and a quarter of the ninjas stationed in the village. Two people had been too many. Jiraiya and Naruto had gone in alone, just the two of them, and took harsh, painstaking methods to hide their insertion. They had been pegged before they ever even started crossing the river from one of the outlying villages. That reign of Nagato's was the radar, and there was no way around that other than two. First of all, there was under it the way that Iwa planned on trying before they were preempted, but they'd gotten too close to tunnel. They'd been in the rain before they even set up their base camp. Then there was the second way. A bit trickier to execute. Over it. Naruto would still be with the main attack force. He just wouldn't really be him. You do know that Tsunade's going to cut your head off and put it on a stake with your balls hanging out of your mouth if she finds out. She'll understand afterwards, no matter how it turns out. Every other Hokage died risking their neck by themselves to protect their village or their people. It was time for that little requirement to be fulfilled by Naruto, unless she knows right now. How could she, Sarutobi Sensei's crystal ball? You think? Maybe she was watching one of or both of them? It wasn't like they were trying to hide their signatures any, and all you needed was the ability to lock onto one that you knew within the limits of the village. I'm pretty sure she figured out how to use it after four years even if it doesn't come with instructions. Naruto added with a grin, that thing is magical. She threw it at my head a long time ago and it didn't even scratch. Jiraiya just chuckled and punched Naruto on the shoulder, have I ever told you about the time I actually wound up stealing that thing from Sensei? No. 
You stole it before? Why? Hey hey. Well he had at least one spare, and do you remember that story about how Tsunade almost beat me to death for finding me peeping at her? Yay? Oh, no way. You didn't. How do you think I did it, in person? No, I had it for three weeks, and then fucking Orochimaru decided he had morals about something. Jiraiya personally wouldn't be going tomorrow, but he'd prepared Naruto as best as he was able to, and he could say that he had been surpassed, even if Naruto never wound up being Hokage. If this was the last day he was going to get a chance to spend time with his godson he couldn't think of a better way to spend it. Well, maybe he could think of a better way, but Naruto wouldn't go with him to peak on hot springs. He had enough potential ladies in his life both near and far that it made doing so redundant for him. Triple X. A few days later, Kumagakura no Sato, Reikage's office. Go home. Get some rest, a stated commandingly to his second most powerful ninja under his command as she stood in front of him, making a request fresh off of a sortie on the battlefield, Yugito, you just had 10 straight days in the field at the front of the lines. I'm not sending you across the continent to take part in that battle. Even as she was standing trying to fight for her request to go through, Yugito looked tired. Ever since being returned to the village by Naruto's escort she had been set at the front lines where she had been invaluable at lessening the losses in the days of the cross-country offensive breakout. For the last week since Kiri had been making landings and switching out with Konoha, Yugito had been used in the liaison role she'd been used in with Konoha in order to teach Kiri about fighting the kind of war they were getting themselves into. With that job it brought even more constant combat while Kiri ninjas were getting their feet wet and taking over the heavy lifting for Kumo in the waning days of that conflict. High levels of stamina or not, her never-ending schedule and the nature of her work had put her through the ringer. Reikage sama I know the dangers of traveling through the countries right now, and I'm not asking for anyone else to come with me. Yugito wouldn't put people at risk like that for something that she wanted to go do. It wasn't really a mission she wanted to go on in particular. It was just that she was afraid. The only way this would end was when pain went down, and there was only one Konoha ninja she knew that would be positioned to fight him, I just want to go. I can't let you. As much as A understood, he wasn't willing to send his best Jown in that he could let outside of the village that far away for something that she probably wouldn't arrive in time for anyway, by the time you get there, everything important will be over. By now, Konoha had long situated themselves in position to make whatever move they were going to make. It would take five to six days for her to even get there. She'd be killing herself to get there in time for the fallout and the aftermath at best. Even if she did have strong feelings for Naruto, and even if he did know how important a relationship that close and intimate was for a Jinchuriki like her, he could not justify sending her out there. Then put me back into the field. Yugito requested, her muscles tense as she dealt with the refusal from her village leader, I would rather be working than sitting around and waiting. Another short campaign and when she returned the next time she could get her news from abroad and know one way or the other what had happened while she was gone, anything would be better than sitting around and waiting. And what exactly would you be fighting with? I asked rhetorically, I'm not putting you back out there and letting you get killed by a stray dumb luck attack or trap because your mind is wandering or because you were simply too tired to get yourself out of it. The best thing you can possibly do is rest. Or is your belief in Uzumaki that low? An accusing look came to her eye as she recoiled slightly, how could you even ask me that question? But he's in a fight with a man that possesses the Rinnegan. That boy is more dangerous than his father, I said resolutely, he lacks the ability of the Hiraishin but he reminds me greatly of him in more than one way. He has certain qualities that the Namikaze had with a more ruthless aspect to him. He was defeated once, but do you really believe that someone such as him would lose twice to the same enemy under any circumstance? In a straight battle against that man, Yugito said with a sad shake to her head, even with his mastery of sage mode, I don't see how he can win. As a stood up, Yugito expected some sort of characteristic outburst from him and was prepared to call Mabui and tell her that a new desk was needed or that a wall needed to be fixed. Instead, he walked up to her and set his hands on her shoulders, and that's your problem. She had not expected him to remain that level-headed in his speech. Not to sound somewhat understanding, what? Your expectations of his actions are too straightforward. I elaborated, he would never fight someone he already lost to the exact same way he tried to do it once before. I'm sorry? A smiled at his finest Kunoichi and chuckled in a manner warmer than she'd ever heard the hot-tempered top ninja ever sound to her. There are certain people who come upon an impossibly large boulder blocking the road and complain that their way has been blocked. There are other people who will try to find ways to move that boulder no matter the cost and proceed down the road. 
and then there are people who will find the path the rolling boulder created and follow it to an entirely new road altogether. Rakage Sama, I. Just think about it. I've told her before turning her around and shooing her off, think about it at home. And when news breaks from the West, I want you to come back and say one thing to me. I want you to say, I understand what you meant Rakage Sama. After having heard of and at times having personally dealt with the actions of Konoha's current greatest export over the last few years, A had long since determined that if you figured that Naruto would zig when it would have been expected to zag, instead he would give you a bumblebee's flight pattern. Even if you expected him to carry out his job in an unorthodox or shady manner when most others would do things directly out of a lack of apparent options, he would do so in a manner that would still leave you stunned. Triple X. Amiga Corps held lands, Kanahagakur Operational Headquarters. If we go any farther into these lands we'll begin being assaulted by Ame ambush squads. Yamato reported to Shikaku Nara. While Yamato might have been in command of Konoha's western operations, Shikaku was the overall man in command of the army's machinations and he reported to him, we've been observing with recon teams. They've got eyes of their own on our divisions. If we break off and either send a diversionary division around or leave one here to mask our movements they'll know it. Amiga Corps for some reason had always been extremely good at keeping the enemy from getting too close to their home village, even at the cost of allowing foreign ninja forces to occupy other settlements around the country. Having been brought in from the reconstruction of Suna along with a few platoons of ninjas that had been stationed there on the mostly peaceful mission of guarding the vulnerable desert village, Kakashi was willing to present his own views and experiences of dealing with Ame, anytime you see rain on the horizon, that's the trick to their sensor jutsu. Pain is the strongest at it but it's a technique taught to more than a fair share of those that have shown exemplary service. A system of marking their officer Jounin, Shikaku said with a click of his tongue. Getting past that kind of sensor jutsu wouldn't be easy. It rained almost every moment of most days in Amiga Corps. They hadn't wandered far enough into the country for that climate to make itself known, but once they did the enemy could use it to track their location at all times. Kakashi's visible eye panned over to the person sitting in on the meeting of commanders and their general the son of his sensei and his own former Janan squad member, the second they find which group Naruto's in, that's the one they'll know is the real threat. Like it or not, Naruto was the only one that could defeat pain. Everyone in Konoha knew it and everyone in Ame knew it as well. No matter how they'd try to disguise it with numbers, or movements, or path taken, Naruto was the key to it all. No matter who he was with, where he was coming from, none of that mattered. The second they sensed him, they would know that whatever capacity he was being used in, that was the method of checkmate being used against them. For some reason, Naruto began to grin in front of all of them, come on, really? He simply crossed the index and middle fingers of one hand with the ones on the other, how many divisions do we have? Naruto's clones. You couldn't tell them apart from the genuine article even with sensor techniques, even with dujutsu such as the Sharingan or Byakugan. You had to simply select one and engage it, and hope that it was the real deal. You couldn't tell which group was the main attack force if there was a Naruto clone with each one. A smile slowly began to grow on Shikaku's face, when the war started and Hokage-sama had you in reserve sitting in on the early meetings with me, I thought you said you weren't good at strategy. I'm no general. Naruto admitted, that's why you're still telling me where to go. I'm good at tricking people though. A nod came from Shikaku as he started feeling better about the chances of keeping their losses low on the push farther into the country, let's start putting the finishing touches on the advanced strategy then. Triple X. With Naruto, 17,000 feet above Amigakura no Sato. Yes, Naruto was good at tricking people. For better or for worse. The thing about pain sensing abilities with rain that had been picked apart and scrutinized after the disastrous Iwagakura attack attempt was his range. He couldn't possibly be in control of all of the rain that fell all of the time. Being able to manipulate when it rained was a powerful ability, and that led to even further delving into the ability. His ability to sense was extremely powerful. Stronger than anyone else's that he'd taught the technique to. It ranged for miles and miles, but its effectiveness varied until you got within three miles of Ame. Three miles, because that was how high up the clouds were in the sky. If Naruto could move fast enough, he could outpace the technique's ability to allow pain to sense him. That kind of speed would be faster than a ninja could possibly run on foot or move in a direct line without the assistance of some ungodly sort of speed or space-slash-time technique. He didn't have that option or that ability, so he had to be stupider in his approach. Stupid like a fox. A suicidal fox. Wearing modified breathers over their mouths that they'd copied technology-wise from Amiga Kura Shinobi, 
Naruto and Sai sat on the back of a large ink bird circling the area they'd marked as being above Amei itself. For the sake of preserving the weapon safely in case something went horribly wrong, Naruto had left the Senenki no Ken at home and instead replaced it with a regular ninjato for the time being. He didn't know if it could be sensed or not due to how powerful the weapon was, but he didn't want to take the risk. This wasn't about brute force and having a bigger cannon than the other guy. He just needed to get close enough to seal the deal, not to nuke the whole town. Due to the chill of being that high in the air, minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit, the two of them wore thick, full body covering versions of their usual root based outfits. No bare midriff for Sai unless he wanted frostbite, so. Yep. Tsunade Bakken would murder me if she ever found out I did this. This is the second worst idea I've ever had. Naruto commented to Sai through a two way shortwave radio built into the porcelain masks on their faces. The messed up thing about this is, if this works, I'm training a squad of Anbu to do this after I become Hokage. Hopefully, you'll find a way for others not as adept in wind release and senjutsu to execute it, Sai said amusedly behind his mask. You'll have to work the other kinks out as well. There better not be any other kinks. Naruto groused, remembering just how much preparation went into this on short notice. We practiced this. We even had Maki Chan work out all of the medical stuff. After she'd gotten over how foolishly dangerous the entire endeavor was, of course. Well, first of all, in the future we can come up with better situational clothing for the operation. I know. It's cold as fuck up here, Naruto shouted safely. There was nothing near them in over three miles, and that was all downward to boot, there's nothing even blocking the sunlight. Why is it so cold? I'm not a scientist, Naruto senpai. I couldn't tell you. Sai responded in his efficiently dry manner of speaking, is this really the best thing to spend the last minute before zero hour talking about? There were better things, like going over the plan once more, or talking about the contingency plan in case Naruto's landing was off. I wonder, if I spit right now could I beat my lugi to the city? Well that was a random thought for the situation they had found themselves in, as well as wildly untopical. I wouldn't recommend worrying about that right now. I know, I know, I'm just nervous. If this doesn't work I've got exactly half of my chakra to work with. You have 15 minutes to get this done no matter what. I know that Sai. I was right there with you when we were making the plan. I'm not going to forget a step. I guess I'm just nervous too. In return, Naruto just patted his junior on the shoulder before he made his way to the underside of the bird where he stuck with chakra, crouched and prepared to rocket himself off downward at a moment's notice, Kurama. Sage mode on, and just remember, you're aiming for the big gaudy tower in the middle. Feeling the wash of natural energy being regulated within him, Naruto let out a sigh and allowed his Sharingan eye to show itself behind his mask, I guess I'm ready for the scariest two minutes of my life. No matter what senpai, pass or fail this mission, you have to last 15 minutes starting. Looking at the synchronized watch on his arm, Sai timed the exact moment of beginning the mission perfectly, now. Naruto jumped as hard as he could, aiming himself straight at the ground. The force almost disrupted the flight pattern of Sai's bird, but he simply used the kickback to turn it around and send it back off in the direction of Konoha. As he flew off he turned his head in time to see Naruto fall the first few thousand feet into the rain clouds. If all went as planned, Naruto would use the principles of his burst limit flight ability to slow and stop himself at a low altitude after inserting himself into the village faster than the rain could keep up with sensing. Depending on where he landed and how smooth the landing was, Naruto could infiltrate Payne's tower without ever touching the ground. That was where the Sharingan came into play. The Sharingan coupled with Sage Mode would allow Naruto to not only analyze his rapid pattern of descent and his trajectory mid-fall, it would allow his body the reflexes to alter his motions as needed to guide his way smoothly. Sai's job was done. There was nothing else he could really do, he'd performed his task. The rest was up to Naruto to put this to rest. As Naruto flew down through the clouds, in a matter of five seconds he dropped the few thousands of feet to begin passing through the rain clouds, emerging through the other side soaking wet. The circular target that was Amigakura grew bigger and bigger as he got closer to it. In Naruto's head he counted the seconds he needed before it became necessary to apply the air brakes as it were. Would be discovered and picked out of the sky before he even landed? Would something go wrong and cause him to turn himself into a stain on the ground? No. To hell with that. He was going to survive this. He was going to make it home. There were too many people waiting on him. Too many people he would leave hanging if he failed. This needed to be done before Konoha tried to move forward and advance. 
Naruto waited until he could make out the spires of the skyscrapers and began slowing his descent with a spread eagle posture, pumping wind chakra ahead of him to prepare for the eventual gravity defying jutsu needed to complete the jump. It was kind of funny. All of this started with an S rank infiltration mission on what was a former Akatsuki member in Orochimaru, and now it was ending on another Akatsuki member years later. Hopefully, this one would end better than that one did. Either way, it felt like things had come full circle. Triple X. Pain's Tower. Konoha would not beat Amiga Core to the punch when it came to the resetting of the battle lines. No matter how fast they turned things around for the move on the village, it didn't matter. The moment Ame realized that Kuzo was a lost cause they abandoned the sinking ship of fighting that campaign and departed back to shore up the lines of their own nation. Even with Nagato's rather vague orders as to how to handle the threat of invasion, there was still enough of a dearth of ninjas that had lived through Hanzo's reign to know exactly how he would have had them go out and keep the enemies from reaching the gates. It had been effective, had never been figured out, and hadn't rusted in that effectiveness in more than 20 years. Added on top of that, Nagato actually wisely teaching dozens of high-level ninjas Yukojizai no Jutsu, Rain Tiger at Will Jutsu, was one thing he'd actually done that made the military ability of Amiga Corps stronger as a whole. Nagato was preparing himself mind and body for the coming defensive campaign. He would be stretching himself thin, splitting the use of his paths all around where needed when the reports of the battles filtered to him in real time. My entire life has been preparing me for this moment. He thought to himself, breathing deeply as he finished his introspective meditation. This was a time where he needed the most clarity he'd ever had in regards to his overall goal, the thought that they can come into a place where they have never won, to a village and country that has never been conquered. Arrogance. This was what they referred to as the quiet before the storm. The storm that he would cause. There was only one ninja the level of a cage left in Konoha's current forces that would undoubtedly come for him and attempt to meet his paths on the battlefield. They needed one in order to take him on, and the only one they currently possessed had already been crushed by him. As he contemplated things to himself, a dark-clad, porcelain-masked figure climbed his way up from underneath the balcony at the far left end of the room, shielded from the rain by the awning that completely covered it from above. Needless to say, Nagato was not what Naruto was expecting. He had to take off his mask just to make sure he was getting a good look at him, Sharingan be damned. He had to make sure what he was looking at was the man himself. Matted red hair, skin as pale as death, emaciated to the point of being skin and bones, stuck full of more strange rods in his back than a radio relay station all in his back, confined to what could only be considered a chakra-powered wheelchair. Fuck. This was a crying shame. What kind of human being should ever have to exist like this? After everything that Jiraiya told him he remembered about his first students, this was a nothing less than a damn shame. But also, with no hesitation on his part, Naruto readily acknowledged that this man was something of a genius. As much as he hated pain slash Nagato's guts, there was nothing but respect from Naruto as to what this man managed to accomplish from what he was. He had brought the elemental nations almost to their knees in this sorry state of being. It had been impressive to learn the truth of the technique before when Jiraiya had explained what he'd figured out, but now as far as Naruto was concerned, after seeing the user of the jutsu firsthand, the six paths of pain were the greatest show of smoke and mirrors he could personally say he'd ever been subjected to in his entire life. It was right up there with Donzo maintaining his status as disabled for decades to mask his Sharingan implants. It was right up there with Itachi Uchiha's double agent status in Akatsuki. Without a doubt. No question in his mind. He couldn't talk about the other two things, but this. This would be put in textbooks in the future, to drive home to every ninja student hopeful just what it meant when they were told the importance of looking underneath the underneath. Who would have ever assumed that the greatest terrorist the ninja world had ever known in its current state of existence was this skeleton of a man. A man that looked ready to keel over at any moment. Naruto just stood right in front of Nagato and marveled, this is the man that almost tore the world apart. It was almost too surreal to stomach. Slowly opening his eyes, Nagato didn't seem at all surprised to see Naruto standing in front of him. His first instinct was to bellow in amazement and question how he was standing there before him, but after killing Toby, I shouldn't be surprised. Out of all of the people who have ever tried to assassinate me, no one else has ever been this close before. And yet you haven't killed me. Naruto, having long since turned off sage mode for the sake of stealth after landing safely, pulled the rebreather connected to the portable oxygen tank on his back from his mouth, you're not going to ask how I got in? It crossed my mind. Nagato admitted, I guess you don't mind sating that curious little part of me since you were the one that brought it up. The last time you intruded on my domain, 
I discovered you before you ever began to cross the water around the village. I had to kind of invent something to get through your sensor rain. Did you know that when you go up past the clouds it's really cold even though the sun is right there? Because I didn't until a few days ago. Leave it to a student of Jiraiya Sensei to attempt the suicidal. They never seem to disappoint in the end. Right back at you. The two lapsed into a silence, and Naruto slowly saw Nagato's face morph into one of growing anger at something that Naruto could only guess at. After what he'd done before making his way to the top floor, he had a pretty good idea of what the problem was. Naruto shook his head and pointed down, indicating the floors below them, if you're waiting on your paths to come busting in here, keep on waiting. Holding up one of the piercings that were the hallmark of Nagato's trademark jutsu, he made sure it was seen clearly before throwing it to the ground, I didn't really appreciate you taking Donzo Gigi's body for that, he said somewhat darkly. He disabled the paths? No, that wasn't possible. But he knew how the jutsu worked apparently, otherwise he would have just disabled the paths and maybe destroyed the he went to the top to ensure that he finished things, which meant that he knew Nagato would be there without a shadow of a doubt. When he wasn't using the bodies and had them stored, Nagato turned off the connection between them and himself. That way he could rest and conserve chakra because it required a constant flow to use the jutsu. Damn it. Why? That random question confused Naruto. What did he mean? Why else would he have done any of this? He was trying to drag every ninja in the world into a state of false idol worship and terror. Nagato wasn't asking why Naruto was there to kill him however. He wasn't asking Naruto anything at all. He was asking the cosmos themselves a question. Why would you give me all of this power? put me through the life I had, show me the true path to changing this world for the better, Nagato said softly, eyes turned to the heavens, allow me to get this close, and then take IT all away with the hands of one of them. The propagators of what makes this world so sick on the inside. Naruto didn't flinch at the sudden change in tone as Nagato spat his message hatefully. There was nothing he had to say in return at first. This sort of rhetoric had been ingrained in him and Naruto's actions during their last meeting in the war overall wouldn't have done anything to give him the sort of stance to rebut such. He was a killer. He killed people. He knew this. More people that faced him in real battles died than survived. He had come to terms with just what he was a long time ago. Because you're such a messiah of peace and all. The scar-faced blonde muttered in return, I'd admit to everything you just said, if you hadn't spent the last 20 years trying to end the world as we know it. I kill but Root never killed civilians. Even when sacking Takigakur, the targets were extremely detailed for a terror assault of that nature, I've never tried to justify any kill I made by saying that I was some sort of god. No one that supports this cancerous system is innocent. Really? How many civilians in Suna did you kill when you crushed it? And I remember hearing people say that you didn't just kill Hanzo and people loyal to him. You killed their families. You killed Hanzo's family, down to the kids. The untrained kids the toddlers that weren't even ninjas. Who are you to question my actions? Nagato replied, you, who readily claims your foundations and root. An organization more steeped in violence and the continuation of armed conflict in the world than any I could ever bring up. I just said I never justified anything I did. But you still are. Naruto didn't raise his voice. He didn't have to. His point could be made on his end without having to scream it in Nagato's face, if you'd just come out and tell the truth. I think I could have some actual respect for you, because you got this close. Naruto held his index finger and thumb less than an inch apart for emphasis, to changing everything. You say that as if I'm finished. The front of the chair opened up and shot a long black chakra receiver rod out directly at Naruto's chest, only to find it slashed away by a quick draw of Naruto's sword. I just want to understand, Naruto said, as if he hadn't just been attacked by the head of the CNF, the head of Akatsuki, and his enemy, what makes anyone think they're a god just because they've got a pretty pair of strong eyes? Why you think you've got the right to pass judgment and show the world what pain is, or what makes Amiga Core so pristine and innocent compared to the rest of the world? How could one such as you ever understand? You're a blight on the planet that can only destroy. I can give life just as easily as I can take it away. This isn't the peak of my power. Until you've lived the life I have, until you've endured the constant struggle I have, surviving day to day, seen the cruelty of the major villages, and seen betrayal, you can never understand. Naruto just shrugged his arms out and looked around as if waiting for some sort of orchestra to start, your parents were killed in front of you? So were mine. And we both got the people that did it back, it just took me longer. Your friend died in your arms? 
I just had to pull piercings out of the man that believed in me enough to stake everything he built from the ground up on me, because you were controlling his corpse. What's your point? My point is, worse things have happened to way more people. Welcome to the life. Suck it up. Ninjas didn't get to make excuses for becoming a psychopath. You lost that right the second you took on the lifestyle of people training to learn how to deal with killing people and fighting against others entirely willing to do the same thing in return. I did suck it up, Nagato spat bitterly, those events enlightened me and formed who I am today. I became a god that will guide the world to understanding by inflicting immeasurable loss and pain on it. Naruto just shook his head, it does sound like you've had a hard life though. Like I said, you would never understand. It's a good thing it's over. Naruto's run-of-the-mill ninjato buried itself through Nagato's chest and found itself twisted deeper by its owner before the victim was allowed to react. In a bid to keep from wasting time in some ideological battle any longer, Naruto activated sage mode on the spot to cover even the short 10-foot distance that it took for him to get to his target. Constantly twisting the blade deeper and deeper until the guard touched Nagato's chest, Naruto held one hand over Nagato's mouth, muffling any noise of pain he would have made. His physical body was too weak to do anything to cast the young killer off in the slightest. My real problem with you isn't that you started all of this. You see a long time ago I came to terms with the fact that people are going to do what they're motivated to do, Naruto whispered to him as Nagato continued to physically struggle futilely, his life slipping away as Naruto continued to twist the sword when there was no way to stab any deeper, no, what I really hate about you, is that you dragged your home, full of people that believed in you, that you were supposed to look out for first and protect, into your little beef with the world. You could do whatever you wanted. There was a reasonable excuse to do almost anything as a ninja to a ninja, but the moment you took over leadership of a country with people to do right by, and you used them as nothing more than vehicles to get your revenge, you didn't deserve the honor of being any kind of leader. With his peace spoken, Naruto moved his hand from Nagato's mouth to the top of his head, Rasengan, spiraling sphere. Take the principle of forming a Rasengan inside of a balloon without popping it, add years of experience forming it in various ways, and apply it to the human head. He was unable to see just what that jutsu did to the inside of Nagato's skull, but then again he didn't need those nightmares. The blood that ran freely from his sockets upon the rupturing of his Rinnegan eyes, as well as from his ears, nose, and mouth was more than enough of a visual for him to declare that he'd finished the job. There was no coming back from that. Pulling his sword out of Nagato's chest, Naruto swung it to clear the blood from it and resheathed it. He heaved a huge sigh from his body. That was more violent than he wanted it to be but he had to ensure without a doubt that Nagato died, at least it took care of the Rinnegan issue too. Nobody needed those implanted just to restart this nightmare all over again. A quick glance down to the watch on his arm told Naruto that there was no need to let the adrenaline fade yet. He took a few steps away, but he wasn't going outside unless forced out there, and he had a bit more time left on the mandatory clock. I have altitude sickness. Like hell, Naruto said in a by-the-way manner, gesturing with his arms wide open, if you want to take your shot, this is probably the best chance you're ever going to get again. It took a few seconds, but the wall collapsed to reveal that Conan had come into the room sometime during the actual process of the assassination. There wasn't any disguising her appearance, the tears streaming silently down her face, no. It won't change anything, she said, walking past Naruto and over to Nagato to smooth down his eyelids to give him some semblance of peace in his post-mortem appearance. Naruto simply let her move past and do as she wished, but he had to ask, you could have stopped me. Why? When he'd turned sage mode on, he knew she'd entered the room after he'd stabbed Nagato. She could have saved him, but instead chose to see things out until the end. Because I knew it had to be done, Conan said, voice trembling as she tried to retain some sort of composure, because he'd forgotten why we started this in the first place. All of this inflicting pain. He wasn't about the peace any longer. All he talked about was making the world understand suffering. The people of this village just became spare bodies. Why didn't you? Because he was still Nagato. How could I? Conan shouted at him before dropping to her knees in sorrow, entirely spent, so I'm all that's left. Now go ahead and finish it. No. Conan's amber eyes went wide and she peered up at Naruto, who said that with no absence of seriousness on his face, W what do you mean no? I'm not saying that I'm doing this for you out of some kind of pity or remorse for killing Nagato, Naruto said bluntly. Now was not the time to mince words or sugarcoat things. He was working with a limited time span at the moment, I'm doing this because if I kill you, who's gonna tell everyone out there to stop before this place gets destroyed? 
Conan looked out of the opening past the balcony and at the skyline of the village. Her village. They would keep fighting even after she and Nagato were killed. It would be horrible. The only thing worse than getting sparse orders like the kind Nagato had been issuing were getting no orders at all from your central command. It would be an absolute disaster. There was no system of command. No hierarchy past Nagato and Conan. The buck stopped with the two of them. Control didn't trickle down any further. Any ninjas that perhaps would have somewhat qualified for the position of village leader had already been killed in the purge of Hanzo's regime. There was literally no one else that could do the job. If she didn't, Amiga Kura really would be destroyed. I don't want this to go on anymore, Naruto said, I don't want a maid destroyed. So I'll ask you one time. Are we done? There's nothing left. Without the Rinnegan, the Ghetto Mazo can't be used to contain the power of the Jinchuriki. It can't even be accessed. Conan admitted remorsefully, I couldn't continue this. And even if I could, I'm tired of the blood. Just leave me Nagato and Yahiko's bodies. Naruto nodded. He'd already taken Donzo's body and sealed it away, and with the Rinnegan gone he had no other use for anything involving Nagato's corpse, you're wrong about something though. You don't have nothing. You still have Amiga Kur. Conan smiled bitterly. It didn't come anywhere close to even reaching her tearful eyes, for the sake of my village and every man, woman, and child that calls this place home. As the new village leader, effective immediately. Amigakura no Sato surrenders unconditionally to Kanahagakura no Sato and the Grand Shinobi Alliance. In a show of this, Konan laid an Amigakura Hitai 8 onto the floor and drew her own blood deeply from her hand to drip freely across the metal plate and cover the grooves of the insignia. The old way of acknowledging definite surrender. I'll send word to the Hokage and the rest of the army, Naruto said quietly, call your people home. Wanting to ask how he could possibly do such a thing before battle began between the two sides and it became chaos to try and bring them to a stop, Conan was preempted by Naruto disappearing suddenly in a puff of smoke. No warning. Looking out through the doorway to the balcony, Conan began to tear up anew. Of course the rain would stop now of all times. Triple X. Mount Mayaboku. Puff. Appearing in a large plume of smoke, Naruto was greeted by the sight of nearly every toad seemingly waiting on what he had to say after Fukusaku had reverse summoned him. Before any of this ever began, Naruto, Sai, and the toads were provided synchronized timepieces so that the time allotted for Naruto's mission was set equally on all sides, the insertion, the mission itself, and the extraction. No matter what, he was only getting 15 minutes to do it, whether he finished everything in three, or died by the time they tried to bring him back. Fortunately this strict time limit was successfully implicated. Well Naruto-chan? Fukusaku asked, seeing Naruto's clothes covered in blood that clearly was not his own. But then again, that could mean anything, is it over? Naruto just walked past Fukusaku and Shima and was given plenty of space by the other toads in the background to lumber past them. He spared a second to create a clone and instantly dispel it immediately thereafter to relay the results of everything to his clones with the standing army, Kami, I hope so. I really can't think of anything else that the universe could possibly throw at us anytime soon. Shima nodded grimly in understanding, you killed Jiraiya-chan's first tadpole didn't ya? Yeah. He answered in a somewhat weakened voice, can you guys take me home? I think I've got the bends. What the hell does that mean? The bends? Gamakichi asked, shouting over his older toad brethren to be heard. Altitude. Altitude sickness. Bad. From 17,000 feet in the air, to below sea level, to the top of a mountain in less than 15 minutes. Yes. Altitude sickness was a definite possibility. Ooh. Can I go lay down until someone summons me back to Konoha? Fast? Kinda got some wartime news to break. Ame. Surrenders. Swaying on his feet for a moment, Naruto eventually did an abrupt faceplant into the grass and didn't get back up. Aw oh, hell. Fukusaku said with a deep sigh, Ma, would you mind head and talk Konoha and summon in Naruto-chan on Tsunade's desk? Hopefully after she finds out what happened she won't stomp him through it. Glorious, glorious victory. It tasted like toad mountain grass. Which didn't taste that bad actually. Apparently it was great for nausea. Or was that just for dogs? Chapter 69 Epilogue, Full Circle With the war effectively over, the early peacetime days of scrambling around for the scraps of power, land, etc. that the defeated Continental Ninja Federation dropped never occurred the way that Iwagakur had planned. The status quo had been effectively shaken. 
They had been effectively frozen out while the GSA seemed completely willing to negotiate and hash things out amongst themselves. In the last few months since the end of the war, even a few of the minor villages that had been enemies managed to garner entry. This was infuriating to the proud village that had always been involved with the fallout from every single one of the three previous Shinobi World Wars, and they wanted their piece of the pie. To be kept out of such an important time in the history of the elemental nations simply burned them up. They were Iwagakur. You did not forget that you set a place at the table when the time came to dice up this continent like the dessert piece that it was. Which was why when correspondence came that Konoha was looking to meet and speak, it was readily accepted. Suna was closer, but after the stunt that Iwa tried to pull in the last few weeks of the war with their little risk strategy of taking Ame and sweeping back for Suna in one fell swoop, the desert dwellers weren't exactly fans of them, even more so now than ever before. With Konoha being the second closest GSA power, they would be the one sending the representative. Anaki figured that Iwagakur had been thrown a lifeline, and the great fence sitter was looking to use it to pull Konoha and whatever else they could out of the boat with them. We could always take this opportunity to tilt things back our way. Kurotsuchi tried to urge to her grandfather as she and her partner Akatsuchi stood at his sides, even if he is stronger than before, he's just one guy with a three-man escort. By the time he returned to Konoha anything could have happened to him. Be quiet girl. Anaki groused, this isn't as simple as him being the Kyubi Jinchuriki. He's Tsunade's next in line for the Hokage seat. Whether it was in five to ten years, or whether it was tomorrow in case of an emergency, their guest was next up if the way he'd been utilized lately had been any indication, apparently the remaining three cage accept this as an action for the future. The towering Akatsuchi began seemingly counting on his fingers after hearing that, ah. Uh, that'd make him how old when he gets it? He asked before looking down and over at his leader, Tsuchikage-sama, how old are you? When are you gonna pick somebody else? When I find the right candidate. How many times do I have to say it? Kurotsuchi just crossed her arms and rolled her eyes at the predictable response that her grandfather gave. It had been the same thing for years, even decades before she was even born. It was just a sign that Iwagakur had been accustomed to the way things were. The system had been something they could easily work to their advantage. It was all a matter of playing the game. And when it came to the game of politics in the ninja world, Anaki didn't believe for a moment that some wet-behind-the-ears apprentice knew what he was getting into. The doors to the room opened with two Iwagakur guards flanking both sides of Konoha's diplomat until they reached the limits of the conference room. The blue eyes of the scar faced down and looked around, taking in his surroundings quickly as he entered and gave a respectful bow to the Tsuchikage as he entered. His own guards were outside, and he was expecting Anaki to send Kurotsuchi and Akatsuchi away as it was meant to be a meeting between just the two of them. Naruto Uzumaki. Anaki greeting with an expression that could only be perceived as a wily, knowing smirk. At his gesturing, his two bodyguards left his side and exited the room, moving past Naruto. They all remembered each other from the short time they'd met during the Chunin exam in Sunagakur well over a year and a half ago. There wasn't enough history there to determine on any side whether or not they particularly liked or disliked each other. Upon being left alone, Naruto took a seat at the table and clasped his hands in front of him on the surface a classic negotiation posture that Tsunade had almost literally beaten it into him to take whenever put into a discussion situation such as this, well Tsuchikage sama I have to say, to hear that you reached out to the GSA, it surprised the Mizukage and the Reikage. Straight to business I see. Anaki's smirk didn't drop however, but not the Hokage or Kazekage? Well honestly, Gara isn't really big on this at all, so he didn't care as long as Iwa had nothing to do with Suna. At all. Naruto let his hands part for a moment to gesture in a balancing beam manner, we've got four villages in this thing. Give and take, checks and balances, you know. Well you seem to be the type that isn't too good at beating around the bush. I am with people that I actually like. Naruto thought to himself in the middle of Anaki's statement. So I'll say that we should simply cut straight to brass tacks. This is for the eyes of your Hokage. With that being said, he passed a scroll across the table to Naruto that the young man opened and began to read over, these are the terms and conditions that Iwagakur requires if our entry into the Grand Shinobi Alliance is guaranteed. Raising an eyebrow, Naruto perused over everything requested inside just to see what this village thought they were working with here. It was interesting to say the least, whether they honestly wondered if they could get away with taking a good number of what was listed there or not. Unconditional backing for pressing Amigakur for reparations paid on behalf of damage done to the military, no. Territory from the western portion of the Takigakur countryside, no. A request for a neutral site for the next Chunin exam, no. 
promises of inclusion in a rumored minor major village trade parity agreement meant to restore a semblance of economic stability to the losers of the war, no. Allowance to annex buffer state minor hidden village Ishigakura that stands between Kaze no Kuni and Suchi no Kuni, hell no. Anaki's smirk fell with every no he received, leaving his face with no touch of good humor upon receiving the final denial, you didn't even send this to your Hokage to relay to the other village leaders. I'm not going to either. I think you're forgetting your position here. You don't have the ability to make the decisions, Anaki said, dropping all pretenses of cordiality at this point. If the boy wanted to be blunt, he could do blunt, you're basically a glorified messenger ninja in this situation. You can title yourself diplomat or whatever you'd like, the game remains the same. Your job is to scurry on back to Tsunade and give this to her, and then maybe you get to come back and return here with her answer. This goes back and forth until a compromise is made that benefits both sides. Yeah. No, Naruto said flatly, rolling the scroll back up and setting it aside. The reason Tsunade Bakken trusted me enough to send me here to negotiate with you so early in my apprenticeship is because there is no negotiation. If you get into the GSA you aren't getting anything. I'm the only one she could send that would flat out say that to your face instead of dragging it out for six months with the back and forths. Any diplomat from Suna would have been completely willing to show up and say it to his face just for the sake of seeing the look on it afterwards, but as Suna was right now, it might have made Iwa feel froggy enough to jump at something. With Konoha, there wouldn't be any rash responses to the declaration that there would be no concessions made. Iwagakura was the last holdout of the Big Five to join. That did not make them special or unique. They had missed the boat and now wanted it to turn around just for them. That was the reality of the situation. And the other four villages weren't keen on making room to a village like that. What the hell is this? What did you think, we were all going to give you something to sweeten the pot for trying to join? No. You get the same conditions that everyone else gets and nothing else. And they would be lucky to get that. The only reason they were being offered the standard conditions of joining the GSA was because it was simply pragmatic to get the entire continent locked down instead of allowing for separate treaties to be set to let this whole mess start all over again in less than three years. The others had asked Iwagakura to join at the outset of the tensions rising between the major and minor villages, but they simply said that it had nothing to do with them and stayed clear. They weren't necessary now, and as things were, if the other villages so wanted they could have Iwa wither at the end of the vine so to speak. Naruto rolled the scroll back across the table and picked up where he left off, you don't have any leverage over any village in the GSA, even the small ones. You don't have a legitimate claim to a single spoil of war against the CNF, because you didn't fight a second of it. Yes, you lost 1000 shinobi, and that's terrible, but you were the aggressor against Amiga Kur. You think leaving us out is the best option then? Anaki rebutted, throwing the scroll away like trash once it reached him, are you really sure that this is the unanimous opinion of the GSA? Even the minor villages now involved? Yes. Your army is hurt from the attack on Ame. You don't even have a Jinchuriki as a deterrent. So trust me when I say, you really want to join now and be done with it instead of doing whatever you think you think you're going to do to screw with things. You see, the rest of the four villages actually like each other. We all fought alongside each other and saved each other's tails. You waited the whole thing out just to see who won so you could swoop in and pick the bones. Suna was actually hoping that Iwa would turn around and try something, because they really wanted an excuse to fight them. No one had forgotten the BS that they'd tried to pull with their sweep through Ame in a bid to conquer them and then swing over to Suna. If Iwa didn't play ball, within 20 years time the Big Five would become the Big Four instead. None of the others really had a problem with that in the least if this was the way that it wound up happening. How much influence do you think you have? Anaki asked, his glare trying to burn a hole through Naruto, I don't mean your alliance, I don't mean your village, I mean you in particular. To say these things to me. Powerful or not, you're no cage yet. You know that I could have you crushed don't you? Naruto's serious countenance actually cracked a bit as his lips turned upwards, maybe. He wasn't going to lie. He was in the middle of Iwa and old man or not, this was still the actual Tsuchikage he was speaking to, but I do know every other cage in the elemental nations, and I know for a fact that right now they like me better than you. If he wanted to fight, either personally or on a nationwide scale, he could feel free to do so. Whatever happened after that point was entirely up to the fates though, and if Anaki was a betting man he wouldn't have taken that wager at his most desperate. To his horror, while he'd been sleeping the status quo had changed. The rules to the game that he had spent his entire adult life learning how to play to perfection had changed without his knowledge, and to get along in this new world he would have to go along. Bitterly he snapped at the young Jinchuriki, 
Is this the kind of Hokage Tsunade is raising? No. Naruto answered straightforwardly, it's the kind of Hokage that Tsunade is raising, that Jiraiya already raised, and that Danzo Shimura built up from scratch. He couldn't have felt any more pride in saying that to the man across from him as he got up to leave, so go ahead and think about that. You already have the universal concessions for inclusion in the GSA Tsuchikage Sama. We'll all be waiting on your reply. Triple X. Tuya Chan. Naruto warned as he and his three guard entourage made their way back home after leaving Iwagakur, get that shit eating look off of your face. Seriously. It's not funny. I heard all of that shit. The sound using Genjutsu specialist noted for Naruto's knowledge, bumping him with her hip as she, Naruto, Neji, and Shikamaru were exiting the country of Tsuchi no Kuni, seriously, soundproof walls and a privacy Genjutsu cast around the room? Who do you think I am? Looking curiously over at Naruto who seemed to be somewhat embarrassed by whatever had been said in the conference, Neji couldn't help but wonder. All he could do was see through the walls, unlike Tuya who specialized in sound-based things, what exactly was said between you and the Tsuchikage? Tuya gleefully opened her mouth to answer until Naruto covered it tightly, need to know, Naruto said in a chiding tone of voice that only made her eyes twinkle, seriously, what am I gonna do with you? MMMPH me. There are only two things you could have said just now, so I just have to ask, was it PG? A shake of the head told Naruto no, of course it wasn't. In return, Tuya just shrugged and chuckled huskily. What did he expect from her by now really? Tuya had become one of Naruto's most constant bodyguards on these recent trips around the continent. Oftentimes she would try to make herself available on his excursions to ensure that she would be able to broker some guaranteed alone time with him. Tsunade tended to hog his time to drill him non-stop on what he needed to know and what would be expected of him as the Hokage. She would have never expected it eight years ago that the stupid kid she'd chased out of Odogakur would have wound up prompting her to fall in love with him, and she never would have seen it coming that he'd wind up as next in line to be Hokage. Either way, she was just happy that this time it was going to be a reasonably quick trip. They'd be back before anything had time to go wrong, and she even got a night to play with him in the hotel they were given rooms to stay in. There was quite a bit of biting, scratching, bumping, and cursing to really be considered any sort of playing, but the both of them had gone to bed happy after it had all come to an end. You know me Uzumaki, Tuya said to him with a grin after prying his hand away, when it comes to you I just can't control myself. She then made sure he had his full attention, giving his hand a quick peck before visibly mouthing later to him. As long as whatever he said doesn't get us ambushed on the way back to the village, I don't care. When it came to Shikamaru, the attitude of the Chunin over the last few months since the end of the war had been mixed to say the least. That's not a very encouraging attitude to have, Neji said, wondering if Shikamaru was ever going to endeavor to get his mess together and get himself promoted to Jown in the way that everyone else in the group managed to, how do you hope to excel any further? I really don't think I want to. The lazy genius admitted. Inside he was wrestling with himself over his dislike of doing active things, and his dislike of having responsibilities presented to him. On one hand there was no more fighting for days at a time, which was great for him because he actually had to give his best in the field. On the other hand, Naruto had basically picked him to shore up the administrative side of things in the future once he started taking things over. While it was more appealing than fighting and leaving the village regularly, the workload that would invariably come with it left Shikamaru dreading the next 5 to 10 years. Oh don't be such a limp dick about it. Tuya remarked in Shikamaru's direction, not getting killed isn't the only reason you should. You can find other reasons to want to do your job. For instance, for me, staying around a yellow-headed jackass that really seems to like it when I make him pull my hair and take me from MMMPFRPM. Once again, Naruto covered Tuya's mouth. Naruto seems to have trouble keeping those close to him in line. Neji pointed out. But it was all in good humor. He knew for certain that Shikamaru and Tuya would follow whatever order Naruto gave them. But they had been around each other for a long, long time. Well to fix it, he can stop taking his friends and lovers with him on these long mission trips out of the village. Shikamaru drawled in return, and I'm not saying that just because I'm one of those friends he tends to bring. That is why you're saying that. Naruto accused, it's not my fault the next gen best are all people I know, including you. It's just troublesome, that's all I'm saying. Triple X. Some time later, Kanahagakura no Sato, Hokaye's office. Months after the Fourth Shinobi World War came to an end, and while things were different, they had fallen into something of a pattern of comfortable normality again. It was a relief after a long time of uncertainty and suspense, even back before the war had actually begun. 
It was over now though. Boy was it over. And she couldn't have received the news that it had been over in a more startling manner. Tsunade's original reaction to Shima turning up to her office and summoning a frothing at the mouth Naruto with bits of grass around his lips was absolutely priceless for the old female toad to see. The only thing better was the series of emotions that Tsunade's face went through upon being informed that the war was over and Naruto had been the one to end it, in exceedingly brave and equally idiotic fashion. The Stages of Acceptance Abject shock that it seemed to be over so suddenly. Unbridled joy and happiness that it was all over. Sober understanding of just what had occurred to make it all happen. Complete rage at the person that had decided to take matters into his own hands to do so. Repeatedly, for several minutes until Naruto woke up and realized where he was. Then he was met with the complete rage portion of the stages. Tsunade probably would have thrown him back above the clouds if he hadn't already been suffering altitude sickness from the constant extreme shifts in altitude he'd been subjected to begin with. This was to say nothing of the reaction of the army when Shikaku learned that the Naruto that had been with him and had been a focal point of the advance plans had been a clone. It was then that after all his experiences in life he understood two things in particular. One, that damn it, that jutsu was dangerous, and two, that Naruto was its undisputed master. Needless to say, the knowledge that the war had ended without a single life lost in what was shaping up to be the next and final campaign of the conflict elicited widespread cheers and celebration from the battle-hardened Konoha faithful that lasted from the early afternoon until late in the night. Even away from home they found the drive to party. It was a celebration. Everything was over with. Even soon and ninjas that had been coming to reinforce the Konoha divisions with extra force wound up getting swept up in all of it. People laughed, they cried, they shared stories of their experiences from everything that had occurred from day one to what they were doing when they found out that Amiga Corps' leadership had surrendered. Naruto's clone stuck around due to being located by some of his actual friends. Instead of bursting the bubble of every single ninja there by saying he wasn't real, he rolled with being the genuine article for the day, and partook in the real delights and revels of victory, including lots of time with some of the women that had found themselves close to him over time. Tamari was especially excited to find him and celebrate the end of hostilities between the two sides, more than willing to steal him away and keep him to herself once she got a hold of him. Shikaku didn't inform anyone that the Naruto with them had been fake, deciding that some things were better kept under wraps. As opposed to the original who spent the day in Konoha dealing with being fretted over by Tsunade while she provided him the medicine needed to fix him up quickly, and being chewed out by her as she forced him to stay behind and assist her in beginning to draft the armistice that would be sent to Amiga Corps. The first thing she would make sure come hell or high water by the time she was willing to drop the reins to him was that even though you were the strongest and the leader meant to ensure the village's safety, you did not put yourself out on a limb unless there was no other option. Things were peaceful now and though there was new business to be had, it was still just business as usual. With the war over with and done, there was a need between the four biggest villages that had come out on top to consolidate their alliance and minimize the ill feelings between the defeated minor villages, or what was left of them so that nothing else occurred any time soon. You're welcome to stay as long as you like before reporting back to your village Yugito, Tsunade said to the Kumagakur Liasen and Nibi Jinchuriki as another meeting had been completed. It was inevitable that something would invariably happen to fracture the good times, but for now they would hold on to what they had fought so hard to enact between each other. All of them had come close to seeing life as they knew it warped into an ugly future forever, and while things might not have been set in stone, the future was brighter than it had been yesterday. I think I'll do that. Yugito accepted with a very sly, feline smile, by the way Hokage-sama, would you happen to know where to find Naruto-kun? I haven't seen him since he came to the last cage summit with you. It's been a while since we. Caught up. I miss him. I'll bet you do. Tsunade thought to herself with a grin and a roll of her eyes, I've been keeping him pretty busy lately, so I've given him the day to tend to his own business. It's pretty serious, but you may just be able to catch him this evening. He'll probably be exhausted though. Yugito just waved and continued smiling over her shoulder as she saw herself out, that's never been a problem before, she said with a closing of the door. If he picks her out of the girls that are in love with him, what kind of baby would two Jinchuriki make? Tsunade mused to herself before raising an eyebrow and a secondary thought at the quite realistic scenario that she had presented to herself, actually, how would that even work with two separate villages? Triple X. Top of the Hokage Monument. The end of the war brought peace many people, including people that had spent their entire lives seemingly moving from one struggle to another. One man had figured that his home was in good enough hands for him to take a permanent sabbatical. After almost five decades of a ninja career, 
Jiraiya had decided to hang up his headband for good. Well, unless he was absolutely needed of course. Then he'd have to step in. It was just his nature to play the hero. The world needed a man as outstanding as him to save the day every now and again, but now he could focus on his passion, writing. The fans were eagerly waiting for what wondrous tales of adventure and romance their beloved author would provide them next, and if Jiraiya was anything he was a man of the people. Mostly the ladies, but ladies were more people than anyone in his opinion. It's weird you know? The white-haired older man said with a content smile on his face, I think this is the first time I can remember where something like this ended, and I really can't think of another enemy on the horizon to fight. Of course there would be one. There always was. But for now he couldn't see one, and that feeling was surprisingly easy for him to accept. Jiraiya sat on the head of the fourth Hokage that had been sculpted into the face of the mountainside, simply thinking aloud as he tried to get some work done on the next installment of his series of novels. Why the hell not? He needed the feedback after all, and he didn't really trust many with critiquing his work. It gave him a sense of comfort to speak aloud as if he were really talking to Minato or Hiruzen depending on whose head he chose to sit on that day, as if he were filling them in on everything that had transpired since they'd departed from that plane of existence. He was glad that his final student's home, where he was now living in his retirement, was extremely close. He could go there any time. Your brat's gonna take your job you know, Jiraiya said with a smile on his face as he scribbled away possible plots and new character developments in his notepad. Due to his one arm, he had to keep the pad on the surface of the carving, it's just a matter of time now. He needs time to marinate in the expectations of the role. And no I couldn't think of a better metaphor, so shut up. The Minato head didn't answer. It really couldn't you see. It was just made of rock. Rocks didn't really talk. You could pop off to them and smack them like the heads of stubborn children all you wanted to and you wouldn't get a response. Don't judge me with your silence, Jiraiya said, as if the stillness of the day were a language in of itself, I could always tell when you were biting your tongue because you didn't want to piss someone off. That's why Kushina always called you flaky. This time however, nature did respond, with a strong enough breeze blowing to rip out a dozen pages of notes from the worn notebook, sending them flying through the air to be scattered to the four corners of the village. Well didn't that suck? Jiraiya just watched them all fly away as there was really nothing he could have done to stop them. He looked directly down, and then straight up with a sigh, Minato, you're a real petty bastard for a guy that had a hot wife and a to be caged son. Hmm. Well this might have been a sign from beyond anyway. Maybe he should retire the Icha Icha series and take another foray into writing a traditional novel? After all, he certainly had a brand new subject that he could base story events off of this time after all. Yeah and now it wasn't like he didn't have the time to compile a portfolio of new ideas. He had lots of time. Nothing but time as a matter of fact. Ugh. But I can't reuse the character name Naruto for this story though. Perhaps he could come up with another name by staring at another meal he enjoyed? It worked once before after all. Triple X. Meanwhile, Forest of Death. Business as usual in Konoha meant a lot of things for a lot of people. For Root it meant covering the future Hokaye's ass from the shadows and doing the things for him that he couldn't be caught doing by others around the world. Or, you know, the whole covering his ass thing. The only safe place in all of Konoha for Naruto to go for the final piece of business he needed to settle up before looking forward to the future was deep inside of the Forest of Death. Not for him of course, because the Forest of Death was anything but safe, but for the village. Even if the Kurama had promised on his tails not to raise Konoha to the ground if he managed to win and free himself, the act of him being released anyway would be extremely destructive to anything in the immediate vicinity. Of course at the moment there were enough deadly things in the forest to worry about before worrying about something that Naruto was already on the job of handling. In Sai's opinion, the spiders in the forest of death had evolved again and become the dominant species. They were also extremely territorial. The feeling of the Kyuubi's chakra emanating from Naruto seemed to keep them from straying too close, but you never knew. Those spiders had the instincts of top-flight predators. I really must say Kiyomizu-san, that I feel uneasy having you here for this task. Sai commented, hand on his tanto just in case something went down out of the blue. He was not going to be caught slipping by any of those damn spiders. They already killed around seven of them on the way to the clearing area, and they were bigger than ever, I can't guarantee your safety to Naruto-senpai so I don't know why you wanted to come here. He and Maki should have been more than enough to protect Naruto from spiders, but since Hamako had come along as well, she'd brought four of her transforming golems that would defend her with lethal force if the need arose. 
Maki was more than willing to accept the help of the will-free equalizers, but Sai was still wary of them after his first brush with one years ago. When it comes to a matter of seals I will always be there for my master, no matter the danger. Hamako commented brightly, hands on Naruto's stomach so that she could monitor his progress with his bijou control battle properly, this is my duty as a retainer of the Uzumaki clan, and I will lovingly serve its head as needed. What does as needed mean Kiyomizu-san? Maki asked, sitting patiently on the ground, eyes constantly panning to her beloved senpai in the hopes that he would awaken soon with full control of the bijou within him. Exactly as it sounds Maki-san. But I'm assuming you mean physically? You already know that I am master's mistress. Why does that not bother you? I've already told you why. If memory serves correctly Maki-san. Sai interjected in the feminine discussion, didn't Donzo-sama deign you to be the future wife of Naruto-senpai? You even claimed to me that you were willing to wed him if the mission required it. So if anyone should understand performing one's duty it should be you. Unless you're indicating that you would enjoy adhering to that task. Maki simply stared at Sai as blankly as she could muster her facial muscles to allow, Sai senpai, I'm so sorry to inform you that I'm afraid your days of flustering me with remarks on my relationship with Naruto senpai are behind us. Naruto had made sure that Maki had more than accepted the fact that not only did she have feelings for him, she more than enjoyed acting upon them. She delighted in getting him to hold her. She oftentimes enjoyed checking in on Naruto at night after Tsunade was done sending him on errands, the intimacy he gave her keeping her coming back. If she was ever indeed directed to follow through with Donzo's original intentions for her, she knew without a doubt that she would do so with great enthusiasm. The very small but victorious smirk on Maki's face upon not allowing herself to be rattled by Sai's comments died when she realized that Hamako was staring directly at her with an unreadable expression on her face. The white-haired girl was no fighter, but what she had shown herself to be capable of creating with her sealing abilities proved to be quite imposing. It was quite possible that the chesty young woman could give someone hell if she so wished. If this is indeed the case, Hamako said to Maki, then the day that this occurs and another woman becomes Naruto-sama's legal wife, whoever it is will receive the same power over me that Naruto-sama does. Slightly less, as his orders will always override that of any other, but nevertheless. What does that mean exactly? If you wed my master I will also serve you as is needed, no matter the task. She then remembered what Maki's definition of serving someone as needed apparently was and added on to her comment, I do not think conceding to your physical whims as well would be that much of an issue for me if you're curious about that. Maki, fully red-faced now, turned back to Sai who merely waved at her in response, a forced smile on his face. He was getting way too good at the whole subtle manipulation of others' behavior as far as she was concerned. Maybe Donzo picked the right person to take over Root after all and as her eyes drifted back to the steadily meditating Naruto, she told herself that maybe he had picked the right person to take over as the eventual Hokage as well. I wonder Donzo-sama. Sai thought to himself, also turning his attention to Naruto, if only momentarily, what would you think about the way things seem to be heading? Triple X. Inside of Naruto's mindscape. Opening his eyes inside of his mind, Naruto was greeted with the sight of an unfamiliar place but something about it seemed to resonate in his mind somehow. It was a village, and it was fairly large, but seemed to be rather old. The structures were built with an older architecture than he would have associated with any modern hidden village. Walking down a main street, something about that place seemed to vaguely resonate with him. And when he found a four-way intersection and found the insignia carved into the pavement, he found out why. Uzushigakur? In a panic, Naruto began looking around rapidly. The last thing that had occurred before he'd used the key to open Kurama's seal for the fight was a bright flash of light as Kurama let him in for the two of them to have it out. Then he appeared in the home of his clan of all places, that doesn't make any sense. I don't even know what this place would have looked like back before it was destroyed. If his mind was going to dump him into Uzushio Gakur for the final battle, he would have expected it to be the old ruins that he had traversed when he and Sai found Hamako and the heirloom sword. He didn't think his imagination was that vivid to make an image of an intact village in his head with this much detail. For Kami's sake he could smell the salt water in the air. Well yeah sweetie you don't, but I do. Wait. This was his mind. There shouldn't have been anyone else in his mind but Kurama. If Kurama was behind him speaking to him though, he would have run him through with one of his claws like a skewer stick. And sweetie? If Kurama ever had the lapse of mind to call him that, he'd kick his ass out of principle and Kurama would probably help Naruto beat the hell out of himself for allowing that to ever even come out of his mouth. It sounded like a woman had said it anyway. 
Turning around to find out just who had the nerve, Naruto came face to face with someone he'd only seen once in a stray picture. Long red hair, violet eyes, and the warmest smile he'd ever seen any other human give him in his entire life, a maternal one. This couldn't have really been Kushina though, could it have? Naruto took two steps back and looked around suspiciously, Kurama you jerk. You called no illusions months ago. We both agreed, they agreed mostly because neither could consciously do them. He was prepared to keep calling out his tenant until the woman's warm hand rested on his face. I'm not an illusion, she said, before taking a moment to think and amend her statement, well, I'm kind of an illusion in a technical manner of speaking. I kind of imprinted my chakra inside of your seal for when you finally decided to take the plunge and fight the QB. Wide-eyed, Naruto stared at the woman as she continued to stroke his cheek fondly, so you're a chakra imprint put in my seal. Yep. That was supposed to manifest when I went to fight Kurama. Ooh, my baby's smart. I still think you're an illusion. Not too smart though. Good. The woman said with a bright smile, if you were too smart you'd make me feel dumb, and you'd never make your mother feel like that would you? Kushina found herself almost lifted up off of the ground when Naruto wrapped his arms around her in a hug. Ah, he didn't think she was an illusion. He just simply couldn't believe that he was actually in the presence of his mother. It was more along the lines of his mother's chakra. A, same difference either way, it didn't matter. In the end, Kushina still returned the tight hug as hard as she could, marveling in how big and grown up her son was. The last time she'd seen him, the only time she'd seen him, he'd been so little and defenseless. Now she felt like the one that was defenseless. Now he was as strong as she could have ever imagined he'd ever grow to be. She could feel it just from being there. Hey! I thought you would have been somewhat expecting me at some point, Kushina said, still hugging her son, since Minato isn't here too I assume he's already run through his shot with the imprint. He didn't say anything about me? At that, Naruto blinked and pulled away from the woman that birthed him, giving her a somewhat vacant stare as he tried to remember, ah. Uh. It was kind of hectic at the time when we met. The only things I really remember are getting an explanation about the masked guy in Akatsuki and bitch slapping dad. You bitch slapped Minato? Kushina asked him in amazement. He told me too. He told you to bitch slap him? Not. In so many words. Naruto admitted sheepishly. Minato hadn't necessarily told Naruto to hit him. He just said he would rather have had Naruto express some sort of anger at him to make him feel better for the ceiling. To Naruto's amazement, Kushina actually began laughing on the spot. You backhanded him. Oh, you're my son, Kushina said, wiping a forming tear of humor from her eye, why use the back of the hand? Naruto hadn't really thought about it until the question had been raised by his mother, Minato's wife, honestly? Kushina nodded, honestly wanting to know despite Naruto's hesitance to say something disparaging about his father right to his mother, bitch face. His face is too perfect for a grown man, a grown ninja man, to have. No wrinkles, no scars, no marks, nothing. He needed to be slapped with knuckle to leave a mark or something. With the way his own face naturally looked, Naruto expected his father's face to have some character. Somewhere. Some sort of indication that this was a man that would kill your army in flashes of yellow in between periodic sessions of stopping in front of you and laughing at the look on your face while he did it. Thank the heavens that he got most of his facial definition from his mother's side of the family, even though her face didn't look anything like his other than a few particular traits. Maybe if he'd been raised with it Naruto would have gotten used to Minato's face. Hell, maybe if he'd been raised by Minato the man would have lived long enough for his face to get some marks of character, but that was not the case. Exactly, Kushina said, dusting Naruto on the shoulder with a grin on her face, people didn't get it why I always said he was girly. I love that man with all of my heart, but most women have to wear makeup to make their face look as unblemished as Minato's. Oh I think I love you more than anything else in the world right now. You'd better. I'm your mother. The shared mirth between the two of them tapered off and only a desire to make this moment last as long as possible remained. They both knew it wouldn't. It couldn't. But for a short while they could pretend that they were really together. That Kushina had lived to see the ups and downs, both the horrible and the wonderful things that made her son who he was, and all of the events in life that made him the man that stood before her. So you defeated the masked man? Aha. Uh -huh. Did you find out who it was? I saw under the mask, but I didn't recognize them. Naruto told her, I don't care who it was. He didn't deserve a name. He took my mother from me. Kushina reached out and held Naruto's face in her hands. 
she just couldn't get enough of looking him over. It was incredible to her. Even with the few Injutsu clearly disguising whatever was in his right eye socket and the vertical scar that adorned the skin on the brow and just underneath on the cheek. Tears came to her eyes. If she or Minato had been around, things could have been safer. If they'd been there so many things would have been different. He wouldn't have had to live in the dark for as long as he did just for Konoha. As she let the tears fall down her cheeks, Naruto just smiled at her, Mom it's okay. A lot of things happened, and I've done a lot of bad things. I've hurt a lot of people. I used to be such a prick to people. I still am kind of. And maybe with you or dad, or both, I would have been a better person. I just want to know, if you don't tell me anything else. I just need to hear you tell me if you're proud of me or not. Kushina's breath hitched as she bit back a sob. No matter what, if you say yes or if you say no, Naruto continued, trying to keep her from sobbing, I just want to know what you think of who I am. There's nothing you can say to make me not love you mom. You gave everything for me. And you should get to judge for yourself how the results of your and dad's sacrifice turned out. Looking at his face, into his eyes, there wasn't any cold emotionless. He was putting himself out there on the line to get the truth from her. It was all he wanted. Luckily the truth was all Kushina was prepared to give. She was never one for lying, even as a kunoichi. You've done so much. The redhead started to say, pleasant and unpleasant things. Difficult things. Things that make me laugh, things that make me cheer, things that make me cry. You've touched a lot of people's lives, some I'm not sure I'm too fond of honestly, but they're important to you which is what counts. You've hurt a lot of people too. Naruto's face fell at hearing the double edge of Kushina's words, but no matter what, you're my baby. And you've done more than Minato and I could have ever hoped from you. I'm proud of you, and even if I'd been there with you nothing about that would have changed. To top this off, Kushina removed Naruto's headband and laid a long, thoughtful kiss on the center of his forehead. She pulled back to find that Naruto was crying as well. Oh man, Naruto said, shaking his head in happy disbelief. He had to say that it was a good thing he didn't know Edo Tensei. He might have been tempted to use it on his enemies just to bring Kushina back every now and again, oh man, oh man, oh man. This is not what I need right now mom. I'm about to get into a fight with a bijou. He remarked playfully while wiping at his eyes. Kushina put on a smile herself despite her reddened, puffy eyes, well don't lose your edge. I'm gonna be watching and I wanna see you win a fight in person. Ha! Huh. You think he can beat me on his best day? At the sound of that familiar, gravelly voice of authority and power, Kurama seemed to fall from the sky right in front of them and obliterate entire blocks of the Mindscape village with the impact he made on the ground. Ah, I've been waiting a long time for this Naruto. You have no idea how happy I am to fight this fight. With the face of his partner slash enemy facing him, Naruto chuckled and moved his mother behind him, Kurama, Kurama, Kurama. It'd be easier to just give up and say that we're partners. Just don't go crying to my mother when I whip you in front of her, he said, his eyes taking on the signs of sage mode as both Uzumakas grinned widely. And don't you go crying to her when I wipe up this village with your face. The titanic fox said, staring down at the two of them with a vulpine grin and intense red eyes. However despite the tough talk, there was no malice between Naruto and Kurama in the slightest. This moment had been established from the very beginning of their working relationship, back when they'd made first contact with one another in Naruto's root training days. They would fight one another for Kurama's freedom when Naruto was ready to take him on. Receiving the key from Jiraiya was the cue that the time had come, and Naruto had been a man of his word. Naruto was the only human that Kurama respected unconditionally for more than purely his strength. And it wouldn't be that bad to hang around if this boy was his partner. No, that was loser talk. He was going to win and free himself once and for all. Kurama didn't have access to sage mode because he would really be moving while Naruto's body on the outside and could actually draw in the energy non-stop due to the stillness of his body. Naruto didn't know how to Sharingan Genjutsu Kurama for an easy victory. Things were as fair as they were going to get for both sides, whenever you're ready fleshbag. Naruto drew his sword from his back and instantly transformed it into his powerful armor, balancing out its energy with sage mode. A small gasp came from Kushina behind his as she touched at the shoulders of the transformed Senenki no Ken protecting her son's body and enhancing him even beyond sage mode. I was gonna kind of help you cheat to beat him. Kushina admitted with a sheepish look before moving out of the way. Far out of the way, I think I'd rather watch this for now though. Don't worry about a thing and go all out. I can't be hurt here. Kurama simply let her move before turning his attention back to Naruto, so how are you feeling about all of this? 
after everything that's happened, and what may come. Tell me. I really want to know. He wanted to hear firsthand the things that made him the kind of person he respected. Naruto shut his eyes and sighed, happy about everything that we've done, scared but really excited too about what might happen, really hopeful that this is just the start. I can't even tell you everything. Not at one time on the spot. With that done, he opened his eyes, a determined smirk on his face as he settled down and steeled himself for the fight. The blades on the tips of his fingers shining just as brightly as his hair and eyes, I'm not done moving forward yet. Naruto Uzumaki, this is who you are. Kurama thought to himself with no small measure of pride as he faced the diminutive human down. Now let's see if I can get to what's at the end of that horizon. The to be Hokage said as he faced down his inner demon, because I'm definitely gonna be dragging you along with me for the ride. The end.